Act One of The Boss by Edward Sheldon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boss by Edward Sheldon. Cast of Characters James D. Griswold. Read by Elliot Gage. Donald Griswold, his son. Read by Chuck Williamson. Emily Griswold, his daughter. Read by Amanda Friday. Mitchell, Mr. Griswold's butler. Read by Todd. Lawrence Duncan. Read by John Smith. Michael R. Reagan. Read by Bruce Peary. Davis, his private secretary. Read by Richard Friday. Mrs. Kyler. Read by Anastasia Saloha. Gates. Read by Tavarish. Porky McCoy, Reagan's rep in the Fourth Ward. Read by Brett Downey. Scanlon. Read by Tex Avi. Archbishop Sullivan. Read by Bob Newfound. French Maid. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Maid. Read by Libby Gone. First Crowd Member. Read by Libby Gone. Second Crowd Member. Read by Todd. Third Crowd Member. Read by Michelle Eaton. Fourth Crowd Member. Read by Amanda Friday. Fifth Crowd Member. Read by M.B. First Police Officer. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Second Police Officer. Read by Anastasia Saloha. Third Police Officer. Read by Sarah Parshall. Police Inspector. Read by Denny Sayers. Narrator, read by Nancy Beard. Act First Griswold's Drawing Room, the afternoon of October 28th. At the back, double doors, leading into the hall, which can be seen when the doors are open. A newel post and balustrade leading upstairs are also seen in the hall. At right, two large windows looking upon the lawn and street beyond. To right front, near the windows, is a low tea table, at present occupied by cigarette box, ash tray, and flowers. To the right at back is a baby grand piano, facing the windows. Near this is a big grandfather chair. Other chairs, smaller table. In several large vases on tables, piano, and the mantelpiece are quantities of superb American beauty roses. They strike the eye at once. At left, the fireplace. As the curtain rises, Griswold is seen walking nervously to and fro. He is a well-bred man of fifty or so, carefully and soberly dressed. He looks very worried and keeps glancing at his watch. He stops to throw the stump of his cigar into the grate, then lights another and recommences his restless walk. Suddenly, he stops at the window, glances out, then goes quickly to the door at back, opens it, and listens. The closing of the front door is heard. Griswold, calling. That you, Donald? Donald, outside. Yes. Come in here. Donald appears still in his overcoat and gloves, a newspaper under his arm. He is a distinguished-looking, brilliant, eager young man of about thirty. The following scene is to be played at high tension by both men, sharply, quickly, nervously. Now what did he say? Wait till I shut the door. He does so. Well? Donald, turning. It's all right. He says he'll come here at five and talk it over. Puts hat and paper on piano. Griswold, infinitely relieved. 
Thank God. You've been just an hour and five minutes. I didn't know what to think. Donald, taking off his gloves at piano. He kept me waiting. His office is jam full. Do you think the people know then? Know what? That he's pushed us out of business. Donald takes off his coat, puts it on the piano. Oh, not yet. Remember, the Western Amalgamated only went over to him today. When did they wire us? About two o'clock? Griswold, turning away. All the rest will follow suit within a month. Donald takes up newspaper. Steady, father. Did you have any chance to talk to him? Oh, not much. He chewed a big cigar and put his feet on the desk and told me he'd had his eyes on our grain contracts ever since he began handling freight in 92. Of course he wanted them. Why, they're the big reason this city has for existing. Half the wheat that goes into the world gets there through this port. Donald, half to himself. I wish I'd smashed him in the face right before his stenographers. Griswold, walking up and down. I've run the business as well as I could. I felt a public responsibility. You know that. And now this Irish tough of an ex-barkeep has come along and swindled and blackjacked and knifed his way up to the place you've... Griswold, stopping him. Don't, my boy, don't. He'll be here in half an hour. We've got to keep cool and think. Donald, continuing his own line of thought. Why, we could have managed him if we'd been willing to stoop a bit and dabble in his own dirt. We must think. That's it. Think. Oh, you could have put him up in the clubs, introduced him to Emily. I could have clapped him on the back, called him by the first name. Ugh. That's what he wanted. He'd have paid for that. Donald, drop it. We've got just an hour to get up something before he comes. But he's a disgrace to the city. He knows it, and he knows we know it, and that's why he hates us so. Father, let me ring him up and tell him we've changed our minds. We'll get on without any arbitrating. Not let him come? Yes. What's the use? He's just doing it to gloat over us. He hopes we're going to crawl and whine. He'd enjoy that. I don't care. I've got to see him and find out if there isn't some way out. There isn't. There must be. My boy, do you realize what we're in for? Do I? It isn't as if the money were the only thing. I know that. It's the integrity of the firm. It's my own good name. Please, father. Those notes, those savings bank notes. What about them? They're due on December 1st. If we fail, I can't meet them. Those banks will go under like that. Stop, father. Don't. And, Donald, do you know what those stockholders are going to say? They're going to say he was a director. Griswold was a director, and he... Door closes off stage. Donald, interrupting. That sounds like the front door. What? Donald goes to the door, opens it, listens, then reassuringly. It's all right. Just Emily. Emily Griswold appears. She is a brilliant, beautiful, assured young woman of about twenty-eight, dressed very simply for the street wearing furs. Emily, stopping on seeing them. Hello. Whatever made you two come home so early? Dad, you're ill. You're white as a sheet. Don, why, what's the matter? What's happened? Nothing. Nothing at all. Yes, there is. Oh, tell me, please, quick. It's all right, dear Donald, and I have to talk business with a man we couldn't very well ask to the office, so I suggested his coming here. You aren't expecting anyone to tea, are you? Just Lori Duncan. He doesn't count. Oh, Dad, you do look dreadfully. Then we can use this room. 
Yes, that it would be better than taking him upstairs. Him? You see, it's Shindy, Mike. You don't mean Regan. She looks at Donald, then back to Griswold. What have you two got to see Regan about? Oh, a lot of things a woman wouldn't understand. Buries himself in a newspaper. Don't be so snappy, Don. Donald, over paper. You may be all right down in the slums, but you're no good when it comes to business. <laughs> Do you hear? No earthly good. You're evidently in one of your fox terrier moods today. Well, is she father? Stop squabbling, please. But, Dad, I... Griswold, interrupting. How's my young scientific philanthropist? You've spent the whole afternoon in your beloved slums, haven't you? Well, where did you go? Emily, taking off her furs. Oh, down in the fourth ward, around the docks. Reagan's district. He becomes lost in his own thoughts. Yes. Oh, it's too sorrowful. The men spend all their wages on drink, so of course the women can't feed the children, and they haven't any shoes or coal. Think of it, with the winter coming on. And the worst of it is, they don't really care. They just seem tired and listless, and they say they can't help it, and that I don't understand. Well, perhaps I don't, but every time I see their faces, I feel all of a sudden how much the world is carrying on its back, and it makes me want to cry, because there's so little, so awfully little, that I can do to help. That's perfectly true. So why don't you drop it, Emily, and act like other girls? Those people can get on without you. You're not so important as all that. As a matter of fact, I'm awfully important. What? You ought to hear what Mrs. Moriarty said to Mrs. Scanlon about me. Oh. She said if the angels weren't built on my style, not even God could make her go to heaven. Mrs. Moriarty must be somewhat of a humorist. So don't ask me to stop working. I won't. Not until I have a big clubhouse for the men and a cooking school for the women. Donald interrupting. And an incubator for the children. That it? Yes, that's it. Are you sure he said five o'clock? Yes. Why? It's only twenty-five minutes now. Glances at watch and clock and looks out of window. Dad, you haven't listened to one word I've been saying. Haven't I, dear? I'm awfully sorry, but I've got so much on my mind. I know it. Something is the matter. Dad, I feel so guilty. I've spent the whole day down in the ward, and you've been in trouble, and I haven't been here to help you. I don't think your Emily's much good after all. But please forgive her, dear, for my sake, and tell me all about it. Now, Father. Nothing, dear. I said so once. Wait a moment. Looking up and speaking positively. It's Reagan. Now, Emily, we have to talk business, and there isn't much time. So run along, dear, please. Do you mind? He takes her by her arms and pushes her toward the door. Emily, shaking him off. Yes, of course I mind. I'm going to stay and hear what you have to say. No, you're not goes to table. Don, stop contradicting me. Even though I am a girl, I'm one of the family, and I intend to be consulted whenever anything important is going on. This is private, though. Do you hear? Private. I don't care if it is or not. Father, make her go away. Oh, dear, please. Emily, interrupting suddenly. I know what it is. Will you tell me if I'm right? You don't know anything about it. Don't I, though? Regan's trying to steal Dad's contracts with the grain companies. Emily, you make me tired. Emily, turning to Griswold. Isn't that right, dear? No. Donald, to Emily, approvingly. There. What did I tell you? He has stolen them. He's done us, Emily. What? Father, do you think this is wise? She's got to hear it sooner or later. You don't mean the Western? 
Yes, the Western went over to him today. But the others? They'll follow like sheep. No, we're finished this time. Finished. He turns away quickly. Emily rushing to him. But, Dad, you mustn't give up. You must arrange it with him. Discuss it. Come to an understanding. That's why we've asked him here this afternoon, but... He makes a despairing gesture. Don, can't you manage it somehow? I'll do my best. If we could get him to keep those thieving hands off the Western for one month, only one month, couldn't I make him lie down and take the count? How? The easiest thing in the world. Well, tell us. Go on, my boy. I'd get his men to strike. Get his men to strike? Could you do it? <laughs> Could I? Good Lord! Why, they're just like a powder magazine waiting for the match. All they need is a leader who studied law and has a little nerve. How many of them are there? Over 8,000. And sick to death of being rounded up like Texas steers with a gang of toughs for cowboys. I could get after his liquor systems, too. The public now doesn't even realize he has one. His liquor system? Griswold, pointing to Emily. There, you see? What is his liquor system, Don? Why, it's his money that is the back of every saloon in the Fourth Ward, and each employee who won't leave half his wages on a Reagan bar before he goes home Saturday night gets his quit notice when the whistle blows on Monday morning. Is that true? <laughs> true? Of course it's true. And that's just one of the little tricks that have made him what he is today. Then that's why the men come home drunk, and the children have no food, and the women say I don't understand. People say that Shindy's out for the dollar. It's a lie. He's out for the dime. And you can take it from me that every penny he owns, he's ripped out of a human heart. Don, why didn't you tell me this before? What's the matter? I've met him. Reagan? Where? At a dinner the streeters gave. He rides in the park. Why, we cantered around the bridal path twice only this morning. Emily! My child. He... He wasn't at all what I'd expected. Of course he was tough, but there was something nice about him. A movement from Donald and Griswold. Really, there was. Something... Oh, I don't know, Dad, but... Why, he was just like a little boy. Little boy? Rot! You're a nice sort of girl, you are playing around with the crook who's stolen your father's business. Well, I didn't know it, did I? You and Dad never open your mouths to me, and then when anything happens, it's all my fault. I suppose I... Mitchell enters. What do you want, Mitchell? Mr. Duncan. He holds open the door, and Lawrence Duncan comes in. He is a lazy, attractive young man of about twenty-six. Well, Emily, I'm glad you don't spend all your time in the fourth ward. How do you do, sir? Hello, Don. Hello. Mr. Griswold, have these two been scraping again? To Emily. What's the matter? You talk as if this were a peace conference. Looking at Donald. But it isn't. She sits down at the piano. Donald returning the look. Not by a long shot. I believe you. Emily plays piano. Duncan goes towards her, leaning over piano. Please, let's have tea. I'm awfully hungry. Donald looks at Watch uneasily. Tea? Yes, you know you promised. Oh, if you've forgotten, don't bother. I'll come another time. He turns to the door. Of course, I remember now. Donald signals across to his father that they leave the room. Emily stops playing. Sit down, Laurie, and don't be a goose. When that man appears... I'll tell Mitchell to send him up to the library. Very well, dear. Daddy, listen. So long as you and Don and I are well and have each other, I don't think we ought to worry much, no matter how badly business goes. Do you? 
My dear, I'm afraid you don't understand these things. Goodbye, my boy. Remember me to your mother. Thanks, Mr. Griswold. Good night. Griswold goes out. Don, will you forgive me? Donald, trying to be stern. You don't deserve it. Not if I promise never, never, never to do it again? Don't bother. I'll take care of that. Oh, Laurie, shall we have some squash Saturday? All right. Bye-bye, old man. Donald goes out, closing the door. Emily, pressing a bell. Oh, dear. I do have such trouble keeping my men folks in order. <laughs> Don't laugh, Laurie. I'm depressed today. What's the matter? Life. That's all. Just life. Mitchell comes in with tea tray. Emily goes to tea table. Here comes your precious tea. Never say again I don't keep my word. Have you put on some of those little biscuits Mr. Duncan's so fond of? Oh, yes, I see. Thank you. Mitchell has taken the flowers from the table and put them on the piano, replacing them with the tea tray. Then he goes out quietly, Emily filling the teapot. Now pull up the big chair and we'll have a nice comfy time. You'd better begin by fessing up, don't you think? What about? Emily, seated, nodding. Those roses? Not gilly. Don't be absurd. They came just as usual. Four huge boxes of them. You might admit it, Laurie, when you see me wearing one. I may be a liar, but I have odd moments of telling the truth. Honestly, I have. And I feel one coming on now. Well, let it come. I'm far too hard up to send you American Beauties at twenty-five a dozen. Oh, yes. I've priced them, all right. Although you know, Emily... If I could, I'd have you walk on rose leaves for the rest of your life. Rose leaves? Oh, people irritate me so when they talk like that. If you'd seen what I have this afternoon, you'd... Checking herself. How do you like your tea? Five lumps and cream? He stops, looking at her curiously. Oh, I don't want any tea, Emily. No tea? Then what did you come for? You said... Duncan, very nervously and obviously bracing himself. I came because I wanted to ask you something. I've been trying to get up the courage for weeks, but... But... Well, there's something about you that frightens me. It always has. For heaven's sake, stop thinking a moment, can't you? Emily, don't look at me like that. It's horrible. Emily, will you marry me? Yes, that's it. I want you to marry me. Now I've done it. He wipes his forehead. Emily, in mild reproof. Oh, my dear boy. Well, what about it? I'm afraid you mustn't talk to me that way anymore. Mustn't talk to you that way? Why not? I couldn't, that's all. Now let's talk about something else. No, we won't. Not till we finish this. I think I've known you long enough, Emily, to say a few things you ought to hear, so I'm going to light right in. You haven't treated me squarely. Why not? Just because you're clever and beautiful and know five times as much as most men, there's no reason for leading them on. Emily, interrupting indignantly. I don't lead them on. Yes, you do. You do lead them on. And then when you've got them all tangled up, poor devils, you take delight in turning them down. Oh, that's not fair. What if they weren't up on philanthropy, economics, civic responsibility, and all that sort of thing? They were mighty fine fellows, some of them. And that counts a whole lot. No, Emily. I'm afraid now. I believe what I used to think I never could. That you haven't any heart after all. Emily, impatiently holding out plate. Oh, take a biscuit and stop being silly. Duncan, refusing the plate. No, thanks. No biscuit. Everybody said you hadn't. But I've been fool enough to think I knew better. Well, I don't anymore. So goodbye. He rises and goes towards door. No, wait. Lori, you mustn't go like that. You may be right about me. I don't know. I feel that way myself lots of times. And yet I do believe, way down, deep down, I believe there is a man waiting for me somewhere, and that I'll know him when he comes along. Don't I look the least bit like him? Couldn't you manage to mistake us in the dark? I'm afraid not, Lori. He turns silently away. Oh, please don't be hurt. You've been my best friend for so long, I... 
I don't think I could get on without you now. Emily. You know the way I mean. But I wish... Do you mind if I say it? It's only because I'm so fond of you. No. Go ahead. I can stand anything now. I wish you'd wake up, Lori. You've been asleep all your life. Oh, I know you've had a good time. And I like good times so much myself that I feel I oughtn't to say a word. But... But there is something more. I wish when you walk down the street, everybody would turn and say, There goes Lawrence Duncan. He's done a lot to help this city. He's a fine man, and I'm proud of him. I suppose I'm talking nonsense, Lori, but you know what I mean. Yes, of course I do. You mean why don't I go down there and start basketball teams and boxing classes for those kids in the fourth ward? Well, I don't know how. But you could learn. I tell you, Emily, it's not in my line. People said that to me, but I went right ahead. But I'd just make a fool of myself. Everybody I know would be laughing at me. They used to laugh at me. Perhaps they still do. The only difference is, I never hear them any more. They seem so far away. She is lost in a sort of dreamy enthusiasm. Emily, you've been working too hard down there. You're a little bit cracked on that subject. You're morbid. Really, you are. Now listen, dear. Leave all those dirty people for a little while and come up here where you belong. Do you mean that? Of course I mean it. Emily, after a slight pause. Then there's no use talking any more. Enter Mitchell. Mr. Reagan, madam. He says Mr. Griswold is expecting him. Mr. Reagan? Oh, yes. Put him in the reception room, Mitchell, until I go upstairs. Then bring him in here. I'll tell Mr. Griswold. Mitchell bows. And Mr. Duncan is going. Mitchell holds open the door, hesitates. Then, seeing that Duncan is not going, he disappears. Shindy Mike? Emily, nodding. Yes, it's business. That's why I'm so worried. When he walks down the street, everybody turns and looks at him. Emily, interrupting and smiling. Shh! Be quiet! He's out there in the hall. Goodbye. Come to dinner Thursday, will you? If you want me. I do. Then of course I shall. He kisses her hands lightly before she can take them away. God bless you, dear. He goes out. Emily, with a sigh, goes to the piano, takes up her furs and gloves, and turns to the door. Just as she reaches it, there is a sound of voices outside in the hall. Reagan's voice outside. That's okay. Here's a dollar for you. Go on and take it. You won't? All right. I'm going in anyway. Reagan walks in putting a bill back in his pocket. On seeing Emily, he stops in sudden embarrassment and smiles. Pardon me, Miss Griswold. I thought I'd just step in and ask you how you was feeling after your ride. I believe my father's expecting you, Mr. Reagan. If you'll wait, I'll send him down. Say, Miss Griswold, would you mind sitting here while I talk to you for a minute? I won't keep you long. I'm afraid I can't, Mr. Reagan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss. She goes out at the back of the stage without looking at him or smiling. Reagan is left to himself. He is a man of about thirty-eight, the Irish-American bulldog type, talks and looks like the tough who has risen to a great position and is not yet at home in it. He is apt to be too polite and ceremonious, but when he is moved or excited, this drops easily away. He is elaborately dressed in a morning coat, with a gardenia in his buttonhole. He wears a diamond scarf-pin and is very conscious of his clothes. After Emily goes, he begins looking about the room, notices the flowers with a good deal of satisfaction. He looks at himself in the mirror, straightens his tie, and then glances suddenly at the door to see if he has been detected. He consults his watch just as the door opens and Griswold and Donald come in. Mr. Reagan. Reagan, shaking hands effusively. Glad to see you, sir, and the young man, too. Shakes hands with Donald. Glad to see you. Sit down, Mr. Reagan. I don't want to take too much of your valuable time. Ah, oh, there's no rush. I got all day. There is a silence. Griswold and Donald exchange glances. Reagan realizes that he is being criticized. He turns ugly in a moment. Well... If you two gents is so strong for business, let's get at it. You asked me to come. Here I am. What do you want? All right, Mr. Reagan. I'll go straight to the point. 
I've been handling all the grain that's landed in this city for nearly 25 years. Since 95, you've managed to get hold of the freight contracts. You were on the inside of dock life. You knew how to manage those men. You could make them work for an impossible wage. Well, you've succeeded, and now you naturally want the grain contracts, too. I've done my best, but I'm afraid I've been too conservative to fight the conditions you've created. During this speech, Reagan has lighted a huge cigar, which he puffs arrogantly. You mean I'm a grafter and a thief, but you'll be damned if you're one, too. That it? You have a clear way of putting things, Mr. Reagan. Well, I heard today from the Western Amalgamated that you've offered them terms I can't possibly meet. All the smaller companies will follow the Western, of course. Mr. Reagan, you've beaten me. You control the grain handling business of this country. Reagan, leaning back. Well, what are you going to do about it? Wait just a moment. I want to make the situation perfectly clear. For a good many years, I've been rather prominent in the direction of three very important savings banks. Reagan interrupting. The People's Trust, the Union Deposit, and the Farmer's Loan, and they put up the money you've been fighting me with. Ye got in securities that won't be worth the paper they're wrote on. Griswold and Donald exchange a quick look. If ye lose that fight, and ye have lost it, Griswold, I've smashed ye, and ye know it. Ye'll file your petition within a week. There'll be a run on those banks, and they'll go to hell so quick they'll never know what struck em. That it? That's it. How did you find out? How do I find out anything? I pound and pay until they cough it up, see? If you take over my credit now, you'll shake the credit of the whole state. I don't give up Bronx cocktail for the credit of the state. The wheat's got to be handled, and so long as I got that, I can hang on through any run that ever happened. And what's more, I'll make good money doing it. Mr. Reagan. Reagan, leaning forward. But you can't. Say, do you know where a run would land you? In state's prison with a steady job as laundryman a washin' underwear. But my securities. Ah, oh, hell, do you think a jury of reformed porch climbers is going to believe them securities was any better when ye gave them than they are now? Hear me laugh. Ha ha. No, ye was a director and ye used the bank's funds to float your own business and ye got left. That's how it'll look on the front page of the one cent daily. Remember that Omaha man, what was his name, Kimball, Kendall? He got twenty for a deal enough like yours to be its long-lost brother. And that was before the days of Collier's Weekly, too. God bless its little soul. I was inside the law. If anything happens, it was only a set of circumstances. Why, I'd have cut off my hand before I... Father! Ah, <laughs> go tell that to the birdies in the park. Taint what ye do that counts in this world. It's what folks think ye done. Look here, Reagan, give me six months before taking over the Western. I have some loans coming in. I can stick it through by then. Six months. Nixie, too long. Four. Not on your gay young life. One. Only one. It can't hurt you. At the end, you'll get the business just the same. Yeah, but I think I ought to be making a moral example of ye guy with swell position born with a silk hat looks down on irish upstarts turns the whole block into an ice house when he meets them on the street mr reagan let him go on father what do you think the depositors in them banks are going to think about your principles when they find that all their savings have gone blah why the fourth ward alone's got over two thousand accounts in the people's trust sure they're only irish hooligans that wouldn't know a cream de menthe from a grand piano but what are ye going to tell em mr griswold when they up and smash your beak off on your way to jail that'll do <sighs> yes reagan i guess we've had enough ah gee the trouble with you patent leather slobs is ye can't tell a joke when ye get it in the eye now i'm not trying to do ye i'm not s'elp me god what do you say to a a compromise compromise what do you say to a bunch up of the two firms bunch up sure take hold good and hard spit on em squeeze em together and out she comes reagan griswold and company no damn it you're getting to be an old man and the drinks is on me 
griswold reagan and company contractors donald and griswold exchange glances of amazement there how does that sound amalgamation that's it but my mouth's too full of teeth to say it gee couldn't we give this town a hunch you and me i wonder you'd supply the polish and the style talk it up big with the church members and first families and meanwhile i'd be round in the back yard with my coat off a doing the work you mean the new firm would be run by you according to your present successful standards while i'd be in front to keep the people from examining too closely into what we were doing that it straight in the bull's eye well you can't do it father i know all about that but i must think of those small depositors that's beyond us father we can't help them but here's a man asking you to come down from the principles on which you based your life and brought us up to come down to his own dirty tricks there's only one answer to a man like that father and that's the door oh that's your line of talk is it controls himself with difficulty no i won't let ye get a rise out of me we got too much to settle griswold if ye come in with me on this i'll let ye manage the business any way ye like i don't care how honest ye make it though we'll lose money of course but god above us money ain't everything especially when ye got a nice bunch of real estate uptown a ripening away like bananas in a dago's bed do you mean you'll be willing to take the lead from me sure i'll jump in and give morality a good fair show after all times is changing and it may pay now better than it used to in that case i'm inclined to say i you'll take me up good shake on it enthusiastically seizing his hand this is a great day for mike reagan all right all right wait a second father what's he letting us down so easy for looking at reagan why he's got us nailed and he knows it donald i don't think you quite appreciate all mr reagan is offering uh, yes i do and i don't like it not one bit turning to reagan there's something else why don't you lay it on the table and be done with it a pause reagan ill at ease throwing away his cigar you're a smart kid ain't she wish i had a couple like ye in the office well you've called my bluff and i don't mind showing my hand he hesitates go on the whole thing mind pause reagan struggling in his embarrassment it's hard to say somehow i don't know why it should be you see mr griswold i didn't care nothing about squaring things this way when i started in to grab your business i believe you go on but i've been thinking now i'd like to make up good and close to you cause he stops well because what cause i want to ask your daughter if by any chance she'd mind being mrs r what marry me that's what there is a moment of stupefaction well this is the finishing touch i tell you it's your only chance griswold controlling himself that's all mr reagan don't let us keep you reagan in all the glory of his toughness ah ye think he's hell don't ye get out that door i'll learn ye ye bunch of stuck-up highbrows i'll learn ye that i'm it and you're knit oh we all know what you can do and we don't care but if you're not gone in one minute i'll call the butler and have him kick you down the front steps i came here with a proposition and two hundred bloody butlers couldn't bounce me before i get an answer you've got it mr reagan not from her don't you dare say her name why not damn it ain't i asking her to marry me donald about to attack him you enter emily dad has she stops on seeing reagan oh i beg your pardon i thought you and don were alone griswold trying to be polite mr reagan is leaving dear in just a few moments go away emily please 
Emily starts to obey and is arrested by Reagan's voice. Pardon me, Miss Griswold. Do you mind coming in for a minute and shutting the door? That'll do, dear. We'll excuse you. Go away, Emily! Will ye come in and sit down? She looks at him, pauses, hesitates. I'm asking ye to sit down. She hesitates again, then still looking at him, obeys. Well, of all the... <sighs> Emily, Dad, and I won't want you here. We've said so twice, and... I guess I'm the one to do the talking. Listen to me, Miss Griswold. Emily, raising her eyebrows. I'm listening, Mr. Reagan. Pause. Donald and Griswold are amazed. I ain't seen ye more'n four times, but I'm no horse car when it comes to making up my mind. I'm thirty-eight years old and never had a sick day in my life, except when some guy laid me out scrappin', and mostly I can say it's been the other way around. I drink now and then, but havin' been a barkeep when young, I know to a finger how much I can carry, so I never throw in no more. I never gamble nor play the races, for the simple reason they seem kind of slow alongside of my business, and I never got mixed up with women of any size or color, cause I've been on the jump, I suppose, and they tell me women takes a lot of time. But now I'm getting along, and I've made my pile, and I feel like settling down and having someone pour my coffee in the morning and put my slippers on the steam heater at night. You mean? I guess you're wise. I want to marry ye. To get a social position for his dirty politics. Young feller, I can put this through without no button in, understand? To Emily. He could help me, Miss Griswold, and I ain't ashamed to say it. But that ain't the reason why I want ye. Isn't it, Mr. Reagan? Suppose you tell me, then, what is. I love ye. Well, that's why. She shrinks a little and looks at him fixedly until Donald speaks. Yes, and he's offered to buy you. He's got us right against the wall, and he says he'll let us off. He's offered father a partnership, promised to back him in everything. What? And it's all on the condition that we pass you over like a Van Dyke portrait for that man to hang in his drawing room. Dear old Dad, Don, if we're going to the poorhouse, then at least we'll make it a family party. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. We can't help a squash up. It's not our fault if the banks go under. Banks go under? And anyway, Reagan, there's no use your staying here now. So move along there and be quick about it. Banks go under? What do you mean? Oh, for heaven's sake, don't bother, dear. It's all right. I mean, you can't do anything. But I don't understand, and I want to, Don. I intend to. Drop it, dear, please. Dad? Now, Father! Wait until later, Emily. Mr. Reagan, do you know anything about this? I know the whole blamed thing. Then tell me, please. Oh, don't listen to him, dear. He's got it all wrong, and... Oh, have I? I don't know about that. Your father's borrowed money from three big savings banks. He just happens to be a director in them all. When he goes bankrupt, that'll start a run. They'll stop payment. Stop payment? Yeah, and all them scoopers of mine that you're so stuck on, they'll lose every bit of dough they've managed to scrape together. You don't mean... Sure. They got their cash in the People's Trust, the steady ones, I mean. It's the only savings bank the Fourth Ward patronizes. Well, it's just that very cash your pa here borrowed, and if he can't pay it back, why, they get left. See? Dad, is this true? In a measure, yes. And all those men down there are going to lose their money. There may be some difficulty. I don't deny that, but... But, Daddy, dear, they have so little. It means everything to them. And we... Why, we're responsible, don't you see? It's a tremendous misfortune as far as they go. But I acted with the strictest honesty, and I don't see. Isn't there anything else you'll take? Won't you offer that partnership on any other basis? I guess not. What would I be getting? Partnership? Do you think Father would consider for a minute anything? He's right. 
father won't do it now but would you be satisfied with half the grain companies putting the other half entirely in his hands would you promise to go ahead under that arrangement and leave him absolutely alone yeah but what about me well him and that young feller promise to leave me alone mr reagan i think you can rely on my family's doing the honest thing reagan after a moment of hesitation all right i'll give him half that's square is it a deal now take me up i've got to there's nothing else for me to do oh emily don't be a fool do you know what you're saying my child reagan deeply moved holding out his hand put it there miss put it there and shake my dear for heaven's sake emily think who you are i can't all i can think of are the men who have their hard-earned little accounts in those banks you haven't seen their wives and children you don't know the misery they're struggling under but i've seen it i know and anything i can do to keep those pitiful little families from giving up and going all to pieces why i intend to do it and nothing that you or father or anybody else can say is going to stop me you hear that tell her you don't want her tell her you won't take her you tell her or i'll ah go on you smoke too many cigarettes you donald keep quiet the servants oh i can see now you've cooked this whole thing up you've been meeting on the sly trying to carry on an affair you know we'd never let you marry him so you make him get a stranglehold on father's business and then you think you've got us gagged and bound you cut that now you think i'm afraid of you reagan but i'm not and i tell you now right between the eyes if you go on with this dirty scheme to get hold of my sister i'll well what'll you do wait and see remember don if mr reagan doesn't interfere with you you have no right to interfere with him that's settled you're crazy give it up emily darling i can't do you realize what you're doing you're choosing between us yes you are it's dad and i against this man i'm not choosing oh don dear can't you see I can see you're a base, disloyal little— Quit picking on her now. I've stood here long enough for listening to your gab, and if that's the line of talk you hand out at home, I don't blame her for wanting to beat it. Gee, the only thing that jolts me is she ain't skipped before. Come along, father. I've had enough of this. Don't let me keep ye. As for you— Checking himself. We'll talk about it later. He goes out with a final look at Reagan. Coming, dear? No. I have several things to talk over with Mr. Reagan. Then I'll stay. Please don't. You mean I'd be in the way? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm... He waits a moment, straightens himself, and goes without looking back. Emily, as soon as the door shuts, with a despairing sob. Daddy! Daddy! Reagan with rough tenderness. I'm awful sorry for you, miss, but they'll come round all right if you just sit tight. They always do, and— Before we go further, I must make you understand one thing. I don't care for you. I feel quite sure I never can. We've got to face that fact together, you and I. Well? I'll keep my word. I'll— I'll marry you. But if I do, it's with the understanding that everything stops at the church door. I won't really be your wife. I can't. That's all there is to it. I... I can't. He comes towards her. No, wait till I've finished. You were perfectly right when you called it a deal. I'll help you with my position. I'll do the best I can for you that way. Ah, oh, quit it. And in return you'll let go my father. I'm perfectly above board, perfectly clear. Just an everyday bargain. If you want me, on that basis, remember? You can have me. Well, that's a pretty sharp offer you're making me, but I don't care. I'll close with it now. You don't mean you'll take those terms? I'll take what I can get, see? And then I get a little more. You won't this time. I'll run the chance. Very well, then. There's nothing more to be said. 
My family are going to make trouble, so I think we'd better finish it up as soon as we conveniently can. I'll get the license tonight. We'll be married the first thing in the morning. That suits you? Could you make it in the afternoon? About three. I have a luncheon engagement. Sure. I'll have everything ready and okay and meet you on the steps of St. Patrick's at five minutes, too. Mr. Reagan, change your mind. Don't do it. Let me off, please. Oh, please. I won't. I won't let ye off. I won't. He tries to take her in his arms. Emily, shuddering and turning away. Remember. All right. It's three sharp, then. He goes to door. Three sharp. Reagan, his hand on the knob. Don't keep me waiting. I'm always prompt. Reagan, with an irrepressible smile. Oh, before I go, there's one thing I want to thank you for. That rose of mine you're wearing? Twas looking at that kept my nerve up all the time. So it's been you? Sure. I thought you'd caught on long ago. Emily, bitterly, as she unpins the rose. No, I hadn't caught on. As she speaks, he goes out, softly closing the door behind him. She throws the rose on tea table. End of Act One Act Two of The Boss by Edward Sheldon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Second Reagan's Library, the evening of April 29th. It is a new, elaborate, and obviously expensive room controlled, however, by good taste. On right, three long windows with heavy brocaded curtains. At right, above the windows and facing down stage, a door leading to Reagan's office. At back, a recessed fireplace and seats on both sides of it. At left, a door leading to the hall and the rest of the house reached by a step and landing. The wall space above and below this door is occupied by bookcases, filled by expensive bindings. At right center, half facing the audience, a long library table, with lamps, papers, and writing materials. Also a desk telephone, and a tray, containing whiskey glasses and a siphon. Behind it stands a large chair, and in front of it a wide, comfortable couch. Near the windows is another smaller table with a lamp. The lighting is soft and restful. As the curtain rises, Davis, Reagan's secretary, a small, worn, little man, is discovered hunting about among the papers on the desk. From the left comes the sound of people laughing and talking. Then the door opens, showing brilliant lights and increased noise of talk and laughter, and Reagan enters furtively, closing the door behind him. He is in evening dress. Say, that guy ain't come in with the ultimatum. No, sir. Not yet. I... I'm afraid I'm in the way here. Oh, that's okay. I got through another dinner, Davis. I'm getting better every day. They'll have me smoking cigarettes first thing I know. Say, we got a swell bunch there tonight. Gee, it makes me sweat to talk to them, though. I just sneaked in here a minute to cool down. Well, I suppose I might as well be getting back on the book job. Book job? Yeah, I'm getting literary, Davis. Looking at bookshelves. I've read from there to there. What are you after? I'm hunting for that interview with young Griswold in the Record Times. The one telling how he organized his labor union and got our men to strike? Yes, sir. Go on, use that to light a cigar. All right, sir. Then I've finished for tonight? Go home and get some sleep. You need sleep when we got a big scrap on like this. That's what my wife says, too. Say, how are the kids? Fine, sir. The new school is exactly what they needed. Nervously. We we never can thank you as you ought to be thanked for. Reagan, interrupting. Ah, oh, rats. Now don't begin on that again. I didn't do nothing but write a check and... The door opens and Mrs. Kyler comes in quickly. She is a fashionable young woman, outspoken, though kindly. She is in evening dress. 
I saw you escape, Mr. Reagan, and I just made up my mind. I wouldn't let you. Well, you see, Mrs. Kyler, I'm expecting a visit from one of them strikers. They're sending me what they call their union ultimatum. To Davis. Good night, son. Davis going out. Good night, sir. The strike? Oh, how exciting! I'm just back from Europe, but I hear it's been the talk of the town for two months. Reagan, proudly. Yeah, we've kept things going at quite a clip. Tell me, how is it all going to end? Will you up and crush your brother in love, or will your brother in love up and crush you? Oh, I do hope somebody is crushed. Reagan, opening humidor. Then you'd better get out your handkerchief for him. They didn't call me Shindy Mike for nothing. I never got licked by a bunch of scoopers before, and I guess I'm too old to begin. He takes out a long black cigar and sticks it in his mouth. Mrs. Kyler, clapping her hands impulsively. That's splendid. Keep it up. She comes to the sofa. Ah, go on. You're kidding me. No, I'm not. I don't think I dare. I've always been so afraid of you, Mr. Reagan. I believe you were the original bogey that my nurse used to frighten me with when I wouldn't go to sleep long ago. But now I've seen you, I'm disappointed, because you're not a bogey at all. You're just, um, a... Well, cut it loose. A man. A rather bad man, I suppose, but, oh dear, that only makes me envy Emily the more. Envy her? There is so much you can do to help you, Mr. Reagan. And the men we help the most are the men we love the best, after all. Help me. I wish she would. I want to be helped, and I wouldn't mind a little loving, too. Give her time, Mr. Reagan. Emily's a wonderful girl, even if she's a snob. A snob? Yes, morally, I mean. And on the whole, you're such a shady character. I don't blame the poor dear if she's mixed up at the start. No, I don't blame her neither, when I stop to think. It is rather hard on her, you know, having you swear at the wretched butler before all her guests. Why, well, I only did it twice. Twice? Well, I guess that's something. I used to cuss him every time he passed me the potatoes. Oh, dear. She laughs, then more seriously. Mr. Reagan, will you do something for me? What do you want? Be humane. Light that cigar and kill it quickly. Don't touch it any more. <laughs> guess you think I can't even be decent to a piece of tobacco. He throws his cigar in the grate. Well, Mr. Reagan, you really are a very black sheep. Do you know I could hardly make my husband come to dine with you tonight? He said he wanted to go to that big mass meeting. It's quite true. I had to be unusually thin with him. Poor feller. Tell him he can go to the meeting later on and yell to hell with Reagan, all the louder, for having lapped up my champagne. And your old friend, the Archbishop. Emily said he was taken ill at the last moment, so he couldn't come. But I don't believe it, Mr. Reagan, do you? I think he was annoyed because your men broke into that union saloon this afternoon and sort of accidentally killed the proprietor. Well, it don't seem to bother you much. Oh, nothing ever bothers me. You see, I'm just a fan. I never get right down and play. But from the grandstand, I see most of the fine points of the game. And that's why, Mr. Reagan, you and Emily are very near my heart this evening. Enter Gates. Beg pardon, madam, but Mr. Kyler is leaving. Mrs. Reagan asked me to tell you. What nonsense! Why, it's barely nine. Very well. I'll be there directly. Piano is heard in the next room. Aren't husbands Boris? I suppose. I suppose we are. No, not you. You are lots of things, but I think there is no danger of you boring anyone. You know, Mr. Reagan, I must be fearfully immoral. I enjoy so much what I entirely disapprove of. You, for instance. He looks at her. Now, Emily can't do that, never could. It seems too bad, and yet... And yet I somehow think it's going to be the making of you both. Mrs. Kyler, would you mind helping me do something? What is it? Reagan, taking two jeweler's boxes from his pocket. Tell me which one of these she'd like the best. He gives the larger one to her. Mrs. Kyler, opening the box. What's this? A frog, a diamond frog. 
with ruby eyes i picked out that sort of cute ain't he kind of natural pipe his leg there of course live frogs are green with spots all over em but that don't make no difference when it comes to jewelry does it mrs kyler trying not to laugh not a bit i think it's sweet mr Regan. what's the other ah just a pearl ring showing box to her the guy at the store was nutty over it but gee it seems kind of cheap to me alongside the other it's beautiful that's so well i'm strong for diamonds speaking for myself they give the wealthy look and ain't that what everybody's after mr Regan. yeah i'd give you the one you chose yourself i'd give you the frog hands back boxes all right i will what is it her birthday no nah, we was married six months ago today i just want her to know that i remembered that's all listen do you hear her playing in there it makes me kind of kind of homesick for some place i've never seen you will mr Regan, before so very long good-bye god bless you shinty mike she smiles at him swiftly waves her hand and goes out he stands for a moment looking after her gates enters by the other door i beg pardon sir that striker shown up yet no sir it's mr mccoy mccoy where there in the office sir he rang the side bell and i thought as you what right have you got to think i'll do all the thinking that goes on in this house turning to door come in here porky gates has held the door open for mccoy a good-looking reckless young tough carrying a soft hat in his hand may i ask sir if ah go to hell very good sir he goes out say mike wait a second what about hurley's bar did you smash it good yeah we put it on the blink but mike and hurley what about him it's all right we laid him out just like he wanted so that's okay now tell me why you're not at st mary's hall this minute a-listening to them guys like i told you to say mike something's doing well and i just thought i'd drop in and tell you about it on my way to the meeting go on spit it out my missus what it's a boy no nah. sure he weighs nine pounds the cutest little duck you ever seen in all your life and your good woman doing fine everything's going on slick say when did it about five o'clock when i was a smashing hurley's bar you know porky shake they do so violently and solemnly we'll have a drop of this to celebrate turns to the table and pours out some whiskey the christian's on sunday week and she said i was to tell you you'd got to stand up with the kid and leave us name him michael r i'll be a proud man on that day porky giving him a glass now let her go to michael reagan mccoy michael reagan ignatius mccoy god help him may he grow up to be as swell a scrapper and as fine a friend as his old man was before him they both drink their liquor at a gulp i thank you kindly mike pause they both look at each other say porky is it true what they say what that kids ain't got no hair on em when they're born whoever says that's a liar and i'll bust him in the mug mine's got a bunch of hair and what's more it curls and their eyes now ain't they closed like kittens for a week or two a week or two nothing why he lay there a blinkin and a winkin at me like we'd known each other all our lives ain't it queer now ain't it queer how people come into the world that's right i don't suppose a man really knows what life means less he's got a kid the music in the next room stops sure thing say mike we just a waitin for ye first one to come to make a bonfire the whole blame ward we'll quit it what's bitin ye Reagan looking around towards door can't she see a wife they rise as the door opens and emily comes in humming the air she has just been playing she sees the two men and stops short then with distant carelessness oh i beg your pardon i thought you were in your office is that you mr mccoy how do you do fine ma'am i thank ye the same to you ma'am it's it's getting cold this evening ain't it is it well i won't disturb you she turns to the door no don't go i got something i want to give ye speaking aside out of the corner of his mouth beat it parky what's bitin you fade away ain't you got the manners to see when ye ain't wanted pardon me good evening ma'am 
I hope you sleep well, ma'am. See you later, Mike. Goes out very embarrassed. Good night, Mr. McCoy. He means well, Porky does, but you see the poor feller ain't had no social advantages. But you'd like Porky if you kind of got acquainted with him. Ah, oh, I know he's a mutt in a parlor, but gee, he's an ace in a bar. Say, you're looking swell tonight. I kept piping ye at dinner and saying to myself, gee, says I, she's got all them other dames lashed to the mast. I think I'll go upstairs, Michael. I'm feeling rather tired. No, wait. Do you know what day this is? Day? Yeah. It's April 29th. Well? Well, think back six months. I'd forgotten. I hadn't. So I took the liberty of... He takes the jeweler's box from his pocket. Emily, under her breath. Six months. Why, it seems six years. It don't to me. Say, Emily. Emily, turning to him. What? Seeing the box. Oh, no. Oh, go on. Take it. It's just a little keepsake. He presses it into her hand. Just something to show that I'm still on me job, striving to please, like they say in the ads. Emily, trying to give it back to him. Take it back, Michael. What? Credit it wherever you got it and send the money to Father Kelly for his Strikers Home Fund. Strikers? The women and children. You understand. But you ain't even looked at it. Say, it's a diamond frog with— Oh, take it! Reagan, taking it. I'm sorry. I didn't know you minded when I gave you things. Gee, if I'd only known, I'd— He stops short with an effort, turning towards the door. That's all right. Good night. Good night. I won't bother ye no more. He slowly goes out. Emily stands for a moment, then turns quickly to the other door, just as it opens and Gates appears. Madam? Well, Gates? There is a gentleman to see you. Now? I'm not at home. It's Mr. Griswold, madam. Who? Mr. Donald Griswold. Why? Why? And he said I was to tell you it's most important. Then I think you'd better show him in. Very good, madam. He goes out. She crosses to the other door, opens it, listens. Then, satisfied, closes it and returns to the middle of the room, as Gates shows in Donald. Hello, Emily. That'll do, Gates. Will you shut the door? Gates bows and does so. When they are alone, Emily throws her arms about Donald's neck with a smothered cry. Don, my dear. Oh, oh, I'm so glad you've come. Are you? I thought it would be the other way around, after all that's happened. Don't be foolish, dear. I haven't seen you for so long. It's five months now. Oh, Don, come along. Sit down here and tell me about everything. How's Dad? Very well. His rheumatism came back in January, but nothing serious. Did he have old Cortland? Yes. I wish he'd change. They say this new man, Winters, is awfully good. <laughs> Imagine Father changing doctors after all these years. Don. Yes? How's the business? <sighs> all right. Though don't you think it's rather rough on Dad and me to ask? Don, why wouldn't either of you answer my letters? We both took your marriage very hard, you know. And I've been so proud. I wouldn't give in and try to make up, even though I wanted to so often. But now, my dear, I never realized before how much I love you. I'm chairman of that big strikers mass meeting tonight, and I've got to be at St. Mary's Hall by 9.30. So, you see, I haven't got much time. I... Emily, how's Reagan? Well, I don't know. In there, I think. Don, you're looking thin and awfully tired. Can't you get off for a week and... Excuse me, but I'm in an awful rush, and what I want to know is... Emily, fiddling with his tie. Why, that's the very last tie I knitted for you. How well it's worn. Donald, impatiently pulling away from her. Do listen, Emily. I want to know what side you take in this anti-Reagan movement. What side? Yes. How do you feel about the strike, for instance? Strike? Yes, strike. The union strike we're running against him. Where do you stand? I don't know. You don't know? I've never meddled in his business. I've just done all I could to help the wives and children of the men he employs, 
and let it go at that. I've been cowardly about facing things, I know. But tonight, the Archbishop wrote me a note. He wouldn't dine here. He told me such dreadful things. They killed a saloon keeper this afternoon. I know. Dave Hurley. Oh, Don, I've been having a terrible time. It just seems sometimes as if I couldn't keep it up a minute longer. Be good to me, dear. Please. I need it. I need someone to be good to me. She turns to him, sobbing like a child. Donald, melting for the first time and petting her tenderly. Oh, poor little girl. There now. Don't cry. I'm right here. Your big brother's right here, and he'll take care of you exactly the way he used to. Emily, trying to control herself. I, I can't help it. It's just too splendid to have you back again. Is it? Then you'll try to help me, won't you? Help you? Yes, it's like this. We... Don, give me your hand. They're getting Reagan's men to strike and join the Union at the rate of a hundred a day. Unless something happens, we'll make him shut down business by Monday at the latest. Why, even now, the Western companies are getting scared. Does he know that? No, but he will. They say he can't stand up much longer, and he won't. He can't, no matter how many dirty tricks he's carrying up his sleeve. Dirty tricks? What do you mean? Why, Gleason. He's our attorney. Gleason thinks that Reagan's just lying low until he can get a couple of thousand niggers up from Georgia or Alabama and start him working at the docks at a quarter a white man's wage. He could do it, too. Damn him. He's the only man I know who could. Shh, Don, be careful. He'll hear you. But before I get after the railroads and head him off, I've got to be dead sure of the whole proposition. And that's why I've come to you. To me? Yes. What about it? Is that his little game? I don't know. I've told you I never interfere in his business. Well, I want you to do a little interfering now. For me. I want you to find out whether this is true, and I want you to find out what road he's going to bring him over. Then we'll wait and nab him in the act. I'm glad he's in. You can get it out of him tonight. Don, dear, it— I'll ring you up tomorrow, about eleven, and— Don, I couldn't do that. Why, of course you could. Just tell him you're interested. Get him talking. You know how. He'll take care of the rest. I mean, I wouldn't do it. What? After all, he's my husband. But you're on our side. You're one of us. I'm your brother when it comes to that. I— I couldn't, dear. That's all. You must. It's your only chance to show Dad and me you're sorry for what you did. That you're fond of us still. I won't, I tell you. I can't. You'd better look out, Emily, or you'll make me think you approve of everything that man is doing. Killing saloon keepers and all the rest. I don't approve of it. You know I don't. You know I hate it from the bottom of my soul. Then why don't you help us stop it? You can. You hold the chance right there in your two hands. <sighs> Good Lord, don't you realize the importance? Yes, of course I realize. But I just know it's impossible. It isn't. It is. And what's more, you have no right to come and ask me. Oh, very well, then. One thing, sure. I'll never come again. If that's the sort of reason that brings you, I hope you never do. Emily! What do you mean by stirring up all this trouble, anyway? Didn't my husband help you just about as generously as any man could? Didn't he pull you up and get you on your feet and give you half his business, exactly as he said he would? He's kept his word, Michael has. He promised he'd leave you alone, and he's done it, too. And that, I believe, is more than you can say. I never gave my word. You're my brother, so I didn't see the need of asking for it. But now... Oh, Don, you've made me feel ashamed of you. I'm ashamed of my family for the very first time. Do you mean that? Yes, I do. You're sure? Quite sure. Good night, then. 
Good. She stops short as the door opens and Reagan appears. Get out of my house, you damn sneaking little son of a gun, before I... Stop that! Reagan, turning to her. What? He's my brother, and he can come when he pleases and go when he pleases, so long as I choose to let him. See here, Emily, I've never got my back up before tonight, but now you're getting just a little bit too gay. Do you know what you are before you're anyone else? I don't care if it's sister or daughter or lifelong friend. You're Mrs. Reagan, got it? Mrs. R. And if you think you're going to sit on my parlor sofa in the middle of my house and tell the guy I'm scrapping to a finish how to land me on the jaw... I didn't say a word. You can ask him if I did. Appealing to her brother. Don? Then I did ring the bell. That was the reason why you came in here tonight. Gee, for a good boy you're getting on great, you are. First you let me help ye when you're down and out. Then, by way of thanking me, ye sneak around and try to get me men to strike. And now, I find, ye trying to make me own wife welch on me. This may be honest, Griswold, but if it is, give me the other thing. Don't worry. You've got that already. Now beat it, you rubber-soled porch climber, ye. Beat it. And if I ever catch you in my house again, you won't get out alive. All right. Keep an eye on St. Mary's Hall tonight, Reagan, if you want to know how things are going. There will be a few live wires you don't expect. Telephone rings. Don! No, I'm through with you. He goes out. Emily stands by door with head bowed. Reagan has gone to answer telephone, leaning over desk with one knee on sofa. Reagan at the telephone. Hello. That you, Porky? Yeah. You're at the hall. Well, have they got a full house? Speak up, there's such a damn lot of noise. What about the street outside? Jammed for blocks? Men, women, and... He smothers a furious exclamation. <sighs> now, go on. I didn't say nothing. Has the mayor come? I can't hear. They got a band plan, ain't they? Waiting for young Griswold? Yeah, he's coming in his auto. I wish it was in his hearse. What? Gates enters. Is Mr. Reagan there? He's telephoning, Gates. Reagan, hanging up receiver and turning about angrily. Well, what do you want? Come on, I won't have no foolin' tonight. A man from the labor union. He said you... Bring him in. Gates turns to go. Reagan suddenly roars. Say, get a move on there, you knock-kneed Britisher, or I'll take the crease out of the back of your neck with the toe of my boot. Sir, I... You fat-headed second girl, beat it now and bring him in. Gates goes out quickly. You must not talk to the servants that way while I'm in the room. I can't stand it. I just can't. Reagan, shamefacedly, at last. Ah, oh, say, I didn't mean all that. I'm sorry. Gates opens the door and shows in the union delegate a rather poorly dressed, defiant-looking, slouchy laborer, wearing his Sunday clothes. You from the Union? Yeah. What's your name? Scanlon. Sixth Division? Yeah. I'm on. I fired you one day when you got to flip. Remember that? How do you do, Mr. Scanlon? V why, ma'am? I... I hope that Mrs. Scanlon is feeling better than when I saw her yesterday. Thanks, ma'am. The dough. He says she's just about the same. Well, we ought to be thankful she's no worse. Excuse us, Michael. Mrs. Scanlon's an old friend of mine, and she has bronchitis. Oh, is that so? Well, come on. What do you want? Choke it up. I ain't got much time. Scanlon, beginning his speech. At the meeting of the board last night, we passed a resolution. Ah, oh, damn your resolution. What's the least you'll take? Ten-hour day. Two shifts, and a general superintendent elected by the union. Anything more? Yeah. Our own saloon, and no one fired for using them instead of yours. Go on. Twenty-five percent raise on wages, and I guess that's all. Oh. Say, don't you want me watching Jane? We don't want nothing that ain't ours by rights. Who framed up that resolution? What's the difference as long as it was carried? Was it Griswold? I ain't a saying. Griswold. I thought so. 
Well, what's the answer? Oh, you want me answer, do ye? Yeah, and if it ain't the kind we like, we'll soak ye all the harder later on. Oh, ye'll soak me all the harder later on. Oh, gee, you make me sick. Come off that bum perch, Regan. We done you, and you know we've done you, and there ain't a word more to be said. Regan, suddenly springing on him like a wild animal. Ain't there. He strikes the man with tremendous force. Emily shrieks. The man falls and lies, quivering on the floor. Regan draws back to kick him in the side. Emily, coming between them, pale and very firm. Michael! What's that? Emily, looking at him firmly. Michael, it's I! He looks at her as if seeing her for the first time. There is a pause. Her gaze subdues him. At last she speaks quietly. Get some whiskey. She turns and kneels by the wounded man, examining him. Regan, returning with the glass. Is he out? Emily, pouring whiskey between his lips. He's stunned, that's all. Looking up at Regan. It's a fine thing to send a man back this way to his dying wife. Dying? But I thought you said— It isn't bronchitis. It's pneumonia. And it was brought on from cold and hunger. The doctor says she won't last out the week. She made him promise not to tell her husband until the end. Why? Because she didn't wish to stand between him and his striker's work. Regan gives a muttered exclamation and sits on the couch, his face in hands. That's what you're fighting, Michael. And you'll never beat that spirit in a thousand years. Has she got any kids? Four. The youngest boy was born last summer. Regan has taken a roll of bills from his pocket hastily. He comes to where Scanlan lies. What are you doing now? Regan, bending over and slipping the money in Scanlan's pocket. Just a couple of bills, that's all. You'll find him in the morning. You nearly kill him, and when he's lying here, stunned and helpless, you think you can make up by putting money in his pocket? Oh, what's the use? Use? Why, ain't you got no feelings? Don't you realize this man's got a sick wife and four kids, one of them a baby born last summer? Don't you know he ain't had no wages since this strike was on? His wife needs medicine to pull her through, and them growing kids ought to stoke up three times a day on meat and potatoes. Doorbell is heard. Say, what's the matter with ye, anyway? Why— He interrupts himself suddenly and turns to listen. A pause. He goes over to the window and looks out. Scanlan moves and groans aloud. Regan turns quickly back. It's his grace. The archbishop. Yeah, he's coming here to see me. We got to get this guy out of the way. Emily, busy with Scanlan. Wait, I think he's coming too. Mr. Scanlan? Scanlan makes another movement and tries to sit up. She helps him. There. You're feeling better, aren't you? Scanlan sees Regan and guards himself. It's all right. All right. Nobody's going to hurt you, Mr. Scanlan. Help him up, Michael. Where'll I stick him? I don't know. In your office, I suppose. Regan half drags, half carries him towards door. I hear Gates. Can you manage him alone? Sure. Put him in the big chair. Regan, as he is dragging Scanlan through the door. And the bish? I'll talk to him. Regan and Scanlan disappear. She closes the door after them and turns, just as the other door opens and Gates appears. His grace, the archbishop. There is an instant's pause. Then the archbishop enters. He is a big-jowled Irish man of much the same physical type as Regan. He is dressed in clerical frock coat. Emily, coming forward cordially, her hand outstretched. Your grace. Archbishop, in his deep, rich voice, to which the traces of a former accent still cling. Mrs. Regan, this is indeed a great pleasure. Michael will be here directly. Won't you sit down? He's just attending to a little business for a, a friend. I hope you didn't take offence at my refusing to come to your party tonight, but after what I'd heard— I understand. Oh, I understand perfectly. Archbishop, very winningly. Mrs. Regan— can't ye do something to stop him? Please, your grace. He'll listen to a good woman. I remember once his old mother telling me how she kept him off the streets for a week just by asking him to help her with the dishes after supper, and he did it. For a week? Well, she was only his mother. I'm only his wife. I know. 
and I thought when he came to me that day and said, Father, says he, I'm going to get married, I thought our lady from heaven had dropped a smile right down into his heart. But now— Please, please, not any more. Trying to control her voice. You don't know. I know there's mighty little any man can do if his good woman's made up her mind the other way around. Ah, try it just once, me daughter, and remember, your two souls will stand together on the judgment day. I feel that I have no right to interfere. The door opens and Regan appears, a book in his hand. Regan, pretending not to see the archbishop. I've just been reading the most interesting book, me dear. Well, if there ain't his grace, God save your reverence, I didn't see ye at all. He kisses the archbishop's ring devoutly. Good night, your grace. Oh, don't go, Mrs. Regan. There's nothing we have to say that you shouldn't hear. Very well. I'll be back directly. She goes into next room. I'm on my way to the meetin' at St. Mary's Hall. Ye ain't a goin' to speak against me, father. That's just what I got to do. But why? Young Griswold was talkin' to me three hours this afternoon, and I find I've kept me mouth shut long enough. Well, if ye open up now, I see my finish. My son, I hope to God ye do. Ah, oh, father. So I just stopped in on me way down, just for the sake of old times, Mickey, to ask ye if ye won't give in before it's all too late. Give me in and take a lickin'. Archbishop, with a troubled smile. A lickin'? Ah, oh, it's true, you never were much good at it from the day your family moved into Dugan's Bar, and my old father, God rest his soul, came over from the old country to run my uncle's grocery down the block. Do you remember? Say, we used to guy the life out of ye back there. When ye first came over, every time ye opened that mouth of yours, ye let out a begora green enough to turn the Fourth of July into St. Patrick's Day. Sure, Mickey, and it's true you never would let me be. Only yesterday I was thinking of the time you got a corner in dead cats and sold em for a dime apiece, a nickel the kitten, to tie on the end of strings and slam us decent boys with when we came out from our Sunday school. Sure, I remember. Gee, I had a swell time that day, and I made a dollar and twenty cents, too. Yes, ye always were the J.P. Morgan of the whole Fourth Ward. But remember, when you'd go too far, I'd rise up in the name of righteousness and beat the pants clean off your legs. Well, ye was older than me, and a blame sight bigger, too. And then ye'd lay for me in Clancy's Alley, with a brick in one hand and a piece of lead pipe in the other. Waiting for hours at a stretch to put ye to sleep like the good kind friend I was. Archbishop looks at him, somewhat taken aback. Well, thank God for one thing, Mickey. Ye never could aim straight when it came to the plumbing. Remember our last scrap behind them packin' boxes on the night before ye sailed away to Rome? Gee, I can feel that knockout ye gave me after twenty-five years. And mighty little good it's done ye, I'm thinking. Ye you know, Mickey, you haven't changed much since those days. Nor you neither, Terry. Suddenly embarrassed. Saving your references, pardon. Ah, Mickey, what a priest you'd have made. And you, your grace. Gee, what a politician. Mickey. Yes, father. Give it up, my son. Get away from Clancy's alley. Emily enters. Why, you've been living here all your life, and you need a change. So why don't you start in tonight and square yourself with the whole town by handing these men over what they want? Slight pause. Then putting his hand on Reagan's arm. It's for you I'm asking it, Mickey, just for you. Well, and if I don't? Then I'll go to this meeting tonight and tell these men that the Church of God is right behind them, and I'll never let up till I've struck ye to the ground, my son, and I can do it. Ye know I can. All right. You've got me. I give in. Do you mean it? Sure. There's nothing else to do. My son, I— 
if ye go straight home from here without showin yourself for speakin at the meetin i'll send em word to-morrow mornin that i'm down and by sunday we'll have settled on the terms do you promise sure i promise are ye sincere can i trust ye to play me square ye can trust me like ye'd trust yourself in fact i've sort of grown to feel that the union's right and i'm all wrong and feelin that way i'd like to make up for what i done to them poor fellows in the past how long have you been feelin this way mickey ah oh, i don't know two weeks off and on how about this afternoon this afternoon yes i don't know nothin about this afternoon you mean ye haven't heard i swear i ain't heard nothin go on what is it about your own gang mccoy and all the rest are breakin into hurley's saloon and clubbin the poor man until now ain't that just too bad i told the boys again and again they'd better look out for their foolin or it would get em into trouble foolin they're young you know and they got to work hard for a livin so i never feel like blamin em too much when they try to get a little enjoyment out of life enjoyment but every now and then they go too far i've noticed that they sometimes go too far say father they ain't killed hurley have they uh, we don't know yet but mickey yeah father you're quite sure no orders came from you this afternoon to do this thing i swear to god i never heard a word about it up to now pause the telephone on desk rings that's mccoy now he's at the meetin tellin me how it's goin answering the call hello porky yeah say what do you mean by never tellin me about this hurley business ye ain't had time well you come up here after the meetin and i'll have something to say to ye understand the idea of such goin's on why folks will think i put ye up to it meself yeah don't apologize now it don't do no good and it makes me all the sorer now who's been speakin down there young griswold how's she goin enthusiasm risin ha <laughs> ha is that so well ain't that nice rumor o' what the last speaker to be the archbishop go on his grace is standin right beside me now and he says he ain't goin near the hall to-night he turns and looks up appealingly at the archbishop god help me i believe ye mickey and i'll give ye this one last chance Reagan, turning triumphantly to the telephone yeah ye can bet on it it's okay just take my word so give em all my love porky and tell em that i don't care what the hell they say he rings off with a grin in a week then everything will be settled for good just one week and i'll have settled em for good and all do you hear that mrs regan i do you know what he means stop that i won't i won't stop until i've told his grace that not one single word you've said is true what say you're crazy gee my wife's gone off her nut he's lied to you he's taken you in from the very beginning why he hasn't the least intention of giving up one inch to those strikers don't listen to her father he's just fighting for time time that's all he wants a week why in a week he's going to have two thousand negroes sent up from alabama to take the place of union men who told ye that look at him he has the truth written all over his face Reagan, turning away with clenched hands god well what do you got to say Reagan, pulling himself together my wife's all off she don't know me that's all i say i've had a change of heart i swear i feel as if every one of them blamed strikers was me brother how dare you say that open that door your grace and look into the next room the man you'll see there brought the union ultimatum to this house to-night he'll show you how my husband treats his brothers father just a second now listen to me please archbishop pushing reagan out of the way get out of me way he goes across the room opens the door and disappears into reagan's office Reagan drops his mask for a moment and has an animal spasm of rage, keeping perfectly silent the while. Emily stands with her breast heaving. After a moment, their looks meet. A pause. 
than the archbishop reappears a stern commanding figure reagan attempting to detain him say it was an accident he fell down by himself i never meant to hurt him why he's one of me very best friends i wouldn't a had this happen for ah oh, father wait now say where are you going to saint mary's all to talk to the citizens of this town as a priest has never talked to em before and when i'm through michael regan you'll stand naked and trembling before the whole world and not one man will let ye touch his garments as he passes by regan seizing his arm and whining oh what's your rush i didn't mean to get ye sore honest to god i didn't ah oh, come father you're not a-goin to leave me this way that ain't no way to treat an old friend say father i let me by sure i will only i just want to make you understand how i feel about your goin down there and let me by michael regan regan throwing aside his conciliatory manner all right when that meetin's finished and not one second before michael do you think you can hold me here against my will i don't think i'm sure and if ye don't believe it why off with your coat terry sullivan and we'll see if all the saints can save ye from a lickin down on your knees michael regan fall down on your knees and pray forgiveness for these blasphemies rebellious child have ye forgotten that the armies of the lord protect his servants have ye forgotten the great church standing like a mighty rock against the waves of sin do you think a wretched straw like you can break its power or change its end from what was written in the angel's book a million years ago ah oh, go on i didn't mean nothing do you think a fool can stand alone and shake the deep foundations of the world out of my way presumptuous man Reagan, cowed steps back and the archbishop sweeps past him with real majesty and strength as soon as the door shuts on him Reagan turns fiercely and bitterly to emily Reagan in an outburst that's a swell turn ye just done me ain't it going back on your husband trying to soak him every way ye could please michael say ain't i treated you well ain't i done everything i thought ye wanted ain't i given up half me business to your old man ain't i put ye in a swell house and deposited a cool million to your credit in the first national don't michael ain't i kept out of your way as much as i could a sneakin in the back door beatin it to my room whenever i heard ye comin michael i've tried to make livin here easy for ye and what do i get in return you wait till i'm scrappin with both hands and breathin hard and then ye up and stick a knife in me back ye i didn't what's that i just spoke out because i couldn't help it i couldn't see you do a thing like that ah oh, it's too bad about you but now's your chance to make it up michael listen it's your chance chance with him on his way down there to talk against me i ain't got no chance all i got is a finish don't let him do it for you give in of your own accord before anyone can make you give in yes call up the mass meeting tell them you've heard their ultimatum tell them you accept it then when the archbishop comes he'll find out what you've done and oh he'll be so glad i won't quit while i got the life still in me you must oh michael i don't want you to do this just to help those men or to please the archbishop or to make me happy i want you to do it for yourself nah don't you see what it means don't you understand you're the only one i'm thinking of it's all for you everything's for you nah michael you must i said i won't please she puts her hand on his arm Reagan throwing her off give in accept their ultimatum let them scoopers know they got me licked say what do you think i am telephone rings oh i don't know i don't know Reagan at telephone hello who is it porky what he's speaking in the name of the holy catholic church what never to work for me again what's all that noise cheerin suddenly he dashes the instrument to the desk without ringing off and glares at emily well ye've done the trick do you hear ye done the trick 
now go on tell me you're glad spit it out get it off your chest and laugh say why don't ye laugh i'm just waitin for that laugh ye think i'm smashed ye think i'm finished ye think i'm knocked to hell well i ain't d'ye hear i ain't i'll beat em yet by god i'll beat em yet his fist crashes on the desk as the curtain falls end of act second Act Three of The Boss by Edward Sheldon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Third Scene The scene is the same as in Act Second. The next morning, about nine o'clock. The room is in slight disorder. The desk is covered with newspapers, memoranda, and clippings. Newspapers with glaring headlines are tumbled all about the floor. Chairs have been moved from their regular positions. Reagan is sitting behind the desk, thus half facing the audience. He still wears his dress trousers, silk socks, and pumps, with a jersey. He is chewing the end of an unlighted cigar. A pile of ashes and butts lies near the whiskey tray, near at hand. He is pale and unshaven. As the curtain rises, he is running through the morning papers, one after the other. Davis, his secretary, is seated at the other end of the table, his stenographic books before him, awaiting Reagan's next orders. Reagan, muttering as he glances at the headlines. Boss Reagan falls at last repudiated by grain companies long fight ends in complete defeat throws it aside give me the tribune here it is sir mass meeting at st mary's interference of archbishop gee they got me in the oven too how's the courier antagonistic i'm afraid go on let's have it reading reagan's finish city's free at last gates enters carrying a breakfast tray with coffee and toast Reagan shakes his head at him in disgusted disapproval. Say, you get out of here. I won't have no dumb waiter in here this morning. Mrs. Reagan told me to bring you some coffee, sir. She heard you'd been downtown all night and had no breakfast when you came in. Reagan, almost to himself. Well, what do you think of that? I beg pardon, sir. I... Say, what's biting ye? Can't you stick it down? Yeah, here on the table. Do you think I'm going to feed standing up like a mule? Gates comes around to the desk beside Reagan and puts down the tray. Got any eggs? No, sir. I... Starting to go. Well, move along and lay a couple. Quick. Gates looks bewildered. Two fried eggs. Grasp it? Very well, sir. He goes out. Read the leader editorial. Yes, sir. There it is. He kicks it toward Davis, then half sits down on end of desk. Davis picking it up and reading it rapidly. We take off our hats to the men who have raised the present issue against Mr. Reagan's methods. He hesitates. Well, got a cramp? We congratulate our citizens upon their enthusiastic support of the strike, which has just ended. Thanks to Mr. Donald Griswold and his union, Shinny Mike no longer holds the city in his grip. The merciless crook who... Uh, is there any use going on, Mr. Reagan? Say, that's libel, ain't it? I'll sue Waterman for fifty thousand. File it. The little ink slingin' mice, I'll show em. The butler enters. Say, can't I sit here two minutes without your making me a present of your mug? More wires, sir. Sent up from the office by special messenger. Read em, Davis, quick. United Transport, Chicago Freight, Erie Navigation. That all? Yes, sir. Reagan, sinking back, disappointed. Well, what have they got to say? All gone back on me, that it? Speak up, can't ye? Davis, reading the telegrams. Yes, they've all cancelled their contracts. They're all negotiating a return to Griswold. I knew they would. Take a wire. Davis, sitting at the end of the table and taking up his stenographic notebook. Yes, sir. Freight, navigation, transport, all the same messages. Fail to understand your attitude. My position in this town never better. We'll have situation controlled within a week urge no action until you see my representative but mr reagan well choke it up 
They can read it in any paper in the country, that the strike's broken, that we're beaten. Ah, oh, dry up. Noticing the butler, who has all the time been standing at the door. Say, come out that trance and tell us what you're waiting for. I beg pardon, sir. There are nine more gentlemen from the papers waiting to see you, and— Tell them to go to hell. I have, sir. Several times. Well, see, they get there, understand? Yes, sir, but— Now, you get a move on before I catch you on the nut with— He seizes the whiskey bottle with a threatening gesture, half real, half mocking. Gates goes out quickly. The telephone rings on the desk. Reagan answers it. Hello? Porky? Where are ye? Down in the ward? Yeah. Go on. Who? Young Griswold? What's he doing down there? Speaking to my own men? Trying to make him join the Union? Aye. What's that? Yeah. Choke him off, sure. Stop him. But say, Porky, not on that hurly business now. No, take care of him. Don't hurt him. Just hustle him out quick, see? He rings off and turns to Davis. Griswold, down on Lake Street, right in the middle of a ward, trying to show my own gang how to bust me. The damn fool. He don't know what he's doing. As sure as me name's Reagan, that guy don't know what he's doing. He rises furiously. Davis, alarmed. Mr. Reagan, don't go on so. Remember, you've been up all night. Reagan, controlling himself with an effort. And I got a long, hard day ahead. You're right, me son. Now, sit down and we'll get to work. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm— The door opens and Emily appears, very fresh and charming, carrying a covered plate. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Davis goes out. I'm sorry I didn't think of the eggs, Michael. Here they are. Reagan, who has taken off his hat on seeing her. Thank you kindly. Gulping. I always think it's a good idea to begin the day with a couple of fried eggs. Are they all right? Yeah, they look slick. I mean— they look real nice. I'm glad. Say, Emily. Yes? Thank you for remembering all this. It was just what I needed. And and you was awful kind to think of me. Why, that's all right, Michael. Assuming authority. Go on. Sit down now. Everything will get cold if you wait. You don't feel like a fried egg yourself, do you? Thank you. I had breakfast upstairs. But I'll pour your coffee if you like. I wish you would. How many lumps do you take? Four. Emily laughs. I like things awful sweet. That's not very grown up, is it? Perhaps I'm not as grown up as ye think. Gee, but this seems natural. What seems natural? Ah, uh, I don't know. Just to have you sitting in the sunshine, pouring me out coffee. That's all. Why, I never did it before today. I know, but it seems natural all the same. Their eyes meet. There is a pause. Well, there you are. Now drink it right away while it's hot. Reagan coming around below desk and sitting down. Say it smells fine. He eats and drinks. She watches him anxiously. Gates said you were down at your office all night. Couldn't you manage to take a nap? No. I'm afraid I ain't got no time for sleeping. That's too bad. Is it? Well, I guess there's nothing to do about it. Oh, before I forget it. Everybody who accepted for dinner tomorrow night has sent in a, a more or less polite lie. They won't come, Michael. Well, I guess I can stand that. Gee, I'd rather beat up three heavyweights any day than talk polite to one of your lady friends. Emily, almost to herself. Even Lucy Darrow and the Gilmores. I didn't think it of them somehow. Remembering where she is. So if you want to, you can make another engagement. That's all. I just thought I'd tell you. She goes to door. <laughs> another engagement? You talk like I was an English duke at Newport. Why, do you know there ain't ten people in this town that let me eat out of their ash cans, free of charge? Emily, with a sudden impulse of pity. Michael, I want to— Well? I want you to know I'm sorry. That's all. Sorry for what? Me? Well, don't you lose no sleep about it. Just lie back and watch me, see? Watch you? Yeah, it's going to be a slick show. What do you mean? Do you think them slobs have got me down? <laughs> I'm just— putting up a little con game now but the minute they let go me arms and say this trip he's done for why then's the time i'll up and nail him to the wall i don't understand well sit tight and you will isn't it all over aren't you beaten beat me say do you know what i'm going to do no then i don't mind telling you ever been to montreal no well i have it's a slick place montreal 
good climate theatres swell people and all that how'd you like to live there emily live there yeah cause you're going to young woman if you hang on to me that's where you're headed for what do you mean michael i'm going to turn the ocean grain traffic from this town to montreal what i said i'd get back at him good and hard and that's how i'm going to do it but but michael i sent the western a wire last night offering em half rates if they'd unload at montreal as soon as i got time to build me own elevators that is and here's their answer picking it up from the desk come in half an hour ago tosses it to emily accept offer have notified our eastern agents please expect shipments at montreal by fifteenth i got em goin emily i got em goin i knew they'd take me up when they heard the rates i'm offerin there wasn't nothing else to do and i made them montreal contractors a proposition they don't dare to throw down i'm waitin for their answer now looking at clock on desk those canadian officials are awfully down on american business i remember once when dad tried to start a branch at oh they got their price damn em you can bet on that and i guess i'm big enough to stand it too you mean sure i'd tip him like i would a bunch of bellhops i see but isn't that risky no nah, if they get found out they're done if i get found out i done right see and you think it will pay pay who wants to make it pay i don't all i want is to get back at this town and that's what i'm going to do the door left opens and gates appears another telegram sir give it here he seizes and opens and reads it then with an outburst of triumph it's okay do you hear they take me up the job's done the whole job's done is it for montreal reagan handing it to her yeah oh gee but this is swell any answer sir i told the boy to wait no nah. yeah give him this tossing gates a silver dollar gates stumbles and drops the coin ah uh, go back to cricket go back to cricket tell him to keep the change he's brought me the best news i ever had gates has picked up coin and goes out emily crumpling up telegram now michael listen yeah there's one thing i want to make perfectly clear what's that if you go to montreal you go alone oh i do do i yes i won't live anywhere else but here you'll find it sort of lonesome work i guess lonesome yeah when i quit do you know what this town will be what a line of shanties two saloons and a dead dog in the middle of the street you're very foolish michael all right you wait and see i tell you i'm going to strip this place till it'll have to crawl into a barrel i won't leave it so much as a toothbrush and a pair of shoestrings to its name i don't believe it all right but just the same you'd better stick it on my tombstone one of them big marble crosses with a couple of first-class angels at the bottom and underneath all in them fancy letters god help mike reagan he turned the wheat to montreal i don't believe a word you're saying reagan looking up a number in the telephone book all right then don't michael what running his finger down the page people's gas home institute line magazine market michael have you absolutely made up your mind about this yeah reading printing theater trust stopping twenty eight hundred main he takes up telephone receiver then i suppose you'll be going up to montreal immediately reagan to operator twenty eight hundred main to her as soon as i've cleaned up things down here to the operator twenty eight hundred main twenty eight hundred i said cleaned up things yeah god hold me cash what do you mean why you don't think i'll go off and leave any loose change floatin round do ye i don't understand reagan to operator suddenly for god's sake get a move on twenty eight hundred main to emily why i got over ten millions invested in this place nearly eleven when you come down to it and when i skip me dough skips with me see no i don't see i don't see at all reagan at telephone hello people's trust yeah connect me with mr fairbanks well i know he's the president that's why i want to talk to him my name's reagan yeah michael r got it pause he puffs at his cigar emily watches him hello that you fairbanks oh i'm feeling fine them strikers well i ain't finished with them yet and that's why i called ye up yeah that's what i mean 
I want you to call in all the mortgages. Sure. Foreclosure. I don't care where they are. Them guys ain't paid no interest on them for the last... Well, I didn't start the strike, did I? Twasn't my fault. I don't give a damn what happens to them. They ain't paid me my interest, and I just foreclose. See? Yeah, I'm calling in all my loans. Sure. Every security I got all over the town. What? Oh, I just feel like it, that's all. Say, you go ahead and do just like I say. Huh? No, nah, cut that. I Say, Fairbanks, that'll do for you, understand? He rings off suddenly, then turns to find Emily close beside him. Michael! Gee, I thought ye'd gone. Michael, I want to know what mortgages those are. Oh, just little ones down round Lake Street. Lake Street? Yeah, that end of town. Lake Street? Why, that's the Fourth Ward. Sure, of course, so it is. You've bought up mortgages in the Fourth Ward. Looks that way. And now you're going to foreclose? Yeah, why not? What's going to happen to those men? What men? The men who live down there. The men you've employed for years. You mean the men that raised this strike and beat me? They're going to lose their happy homes. That's what's going to happen to them. You go down there next week and you'll find every sidewalk in the ward piled up with bed quilts and bureaus and rocking chairs and gas stoves. Oh, no! Yeah, and you'll run across your friend, Mrs. Moriarty, sitting on the corner of Lake and River, selling matches in the rain. And Scanlon, you remember Scanlon? Well, he'll be sweeping streets, if he's lucky, that is. No. And the only grub the Baxter kids'll get will be them little minnies ye fish for off the docks, and old Lady Hogan'll have to climb out of bed and sling a sack over her shoulder and start in alley licking. Stop it! Michael! And all the time I'll be leaning back up there in Montreal, smoking me cigar and taking it all in. He tilts back chair, stretches, and puts his feet on desk. But, Michael, those families have suffered enough already. The strike nearly finished them. They have nothing left. I thought I'd wake you up. Well, it serves them right. And they're the very people that made you. They've given you everything you have, every tiny little thing. What of it? Don't you see? You can't turn on them this way. Can't I? Say, watch me. Jump on them from behind like some wild animal they've had to punish. Ah, oh, dry up on that. Get even, get back at them, just to satisfy your own miserable little idea of revenge. Revenge? That's it. I got them all like that. Holding out one hand with slowly closing fingers. I'm going to squeeze them till I hear their bones are cracking. No, you can't. It's too cruel, too hideously cruel. Ah, forget it. I married you to keep those people from being ruined. I gave up a great deal when I did that, Michael. And now I'm not going to see my sacrifice. Reagan turns quickly. That's what it was. I won't see my sacrifice turned into an absolutely useless thing. Well, how are you going to help it? I don't know. I don't know anything except that I'm your wife. And so you can't do this. I'm your wife. Do you understand? Your wife. You lie. You're not my wife and you know it. My wife? Ha! <laughs> That's a good one, that is. I guess if you was my wife, I might be feeling different. I guess I'd have no right to start a big thing that me missus was so strong against. But you? You've built a wall round yourself to keep me out, and gee, it done the job. Why, I seen ye crack a smile at the butler there and talk to him almost like he was human. But me? Say, have you ever done any more than that to me? No, my God, you let me live here in the same house with ye day after day. You let me lie alone there in my bed night after night, thinking of the locked door between us and suffering through the black hours like I didn't know a man could suffer, wishing the day would break and find me dead. Michael! You say ye feel sorry for them strikers. Well, let me tell ye right here, there's not one of them that ain't got more than me. I don't care if he's cold and his stomach's empty and the window's busted and the roof's leaking. He's got someone to love him. So I guess he'll see it through. But me? Why, ye kept it all back from me. All what I want most in the world. Me feelings, me rights, are the best things God ever gave us men. What have ye done with em, woman? And say now, where do ye get the nerve to call yourself my wife? Michael, you have no right to talk to me like this. You may have forgotten the agreement we made before I married you, but I haven't. I've lived up to every word of it. I've done every single thing I said I would. He starts to speak. No, wait. There's something else. 
I've been perfectly right, but I... I didn't realize you felt like this. I didn't dream you, but... Michael, so long as you do, I'm willing now to go on. I'm willing to go ahead. I'm willing to make another bargain. What's that? I'll change. I'll be different. Be different? Say, quit that or someday I'll... Why, don't you want me to be different? Reagan, looking at her with almost a sob. You know, oh gee, you know. All right, then. I will. Huh? If you give up this dreadful idea of yours. If you stay here and take your beating like a man. Do you mean? Say, you don't mean if... Yes, I do. No, nah, you can't. Beat it now. I give you a warning. Beat it while you got the chance. He covers his face with his hands. I won't. Don't. Well? Oh, my God. Emily, with her last vestige of strength. Tell me. Reagan, rushing at her with a cry. Emily! Gathering her to him. I'd go to hell for this and lay there, Emily, and lay a smile in there forever and forever. Stop shaking. Hold your head up, sweetie. I love ye. I love ye. For the first time, he kisses her. Emily, trying to tear herself away. Stop it! Keep away! Ye love me! Gee, ye love me, and I never knew. I don't! I hate you! You're giving in cause you want to! Stop it! Stop it, I tell you! You're doing it of your own free will! How dare you say that! Well, ain't it true? No! No! I tell you, I'm selling myself for a price! A price! Emily! I'm paying you just as if it were money! I'm paying you cash down, because it's the only thing you'll take. Emily, for the love of God. I want you to know. I've got to make you understand. It's just another bargain. You're getting me cheap. Do you hear that? Cheap. I'm going dirt cheap. Stop it. He covers her mouth with his hand. I done some rotten things in me time, and I guess you know it too, but gee, I never done nothing half so rotten as what you're doing now. Oh, oh! Selling yourself, paying me cash down, going cheap. God, do you think I want ye if that's how ye come? Do you think I'll take my wife that way? I guess ye don't know much about real men. If ye did, ye'd never try to pull off such a deal. He'd never a made me feel ashamed of ye. Yeah, ashamed, like I'm feeling now. <laughs> ashamed? You! I tell ye, my kids are going to be born cause I loved their mother with all me body and mind and soul, and cause she loved me back with all of hers, and if such things as that can't be, why then, so help me God, I'll have no kids at all. McCoy, bursting in from right. Mike! He stands leaning against the wall. Excuse me. Reagan releases Emily, who goes out the other door quickly. Say, Mike! Gee, Porky, you look all in. What's the game? It's young Griswold. Who? Come over here and tell me. McCoy, half falling on the sofa. Give me a drink. I run all the way from Lake Street. Sit down. At the desk, pouring whiskey. Well, go on. He came down to the ward to spiel, you know. He got up on a barrel, aware in one of them knobbly little dips, and he just sailed into you, Mike, saying how he got ye licked, calling ye all the dirty names you could think of. And I sort of went off me nut, and seeing as I happened to have a brick in me hand, I guess I just heaved it, and it caught him in the head, and... and he went down. Reagan, glancing round. You... He goes to the door by which Emily left and closes it, then, in a low voice, turning round. Is he dead? Is he dead? Taking McCoy by lapels of coat and pulling him around fiercely. Go on and tell me. Tell me. You got to tell me. I don't know. They took him into Duggan's cafe, and then the ambulance came and got him. Reagan, in an outburst, throwing McCoy against the back of sofa. Damn ye, Parky. Damn ye. Damn ye. Say, Mike, I didn't mean to do it. Honest to God, I didn't. All I wanted was to knock his lid off. Oh, what did he have to come down for anyways? He might have known he'd get soaked in your own ward. And I'd have given me right arm to have kept him safe. I know you would, but there's no use talking now. Clinging to him. What'll I do? Mike, I got a sick wife and a new kid. Tell me what I'll do. Shut up, Porky, or the whole house'll hear ye. Now listen, did anyone see ye fire that brick? No, nah, they was all looking at him. I was on the outside. You're sure nobody piped ye? Sure. Why, I'm one of the guys that carried him into the cafe. And it's all right. 
go home to the wife and kid and keep your mouth shut understand not do nothing not a damn thing and if there's any trouble i'll look after ye ah oh, thank you mike grasps regan's hand i knew you'd fix it up for me go on now beat it remember me to the missus and how's the kid today getting bigger and gee his wrinkles is all coming off enter davis mr regan wait a second you sure that's all okay i said so once thank you mike so long he goes out regan to davis who is at window well what do you want the low murmur of an approaching crowd is heard in the distance mr regan do you hear anything regan after listening a moment yeah what is it sounds like a crowd i think they're coming up concord avenue regan looking out window the hell they are and there's a gentleman says he must see you i won't see no one here he is enter duncan full of excitement regan well what do you want donald griswold went down to speak in the fourth ward and was set on by some of your toughs he's hurt nobody knows how badly he may be dead the sound outside increases and that out there the whole town's up in arms they're sure you did it me or had it done they're sure you gave the orders of course they are reagan i came to tell you the police are on their way mr griswold's had a warrant sworn out you're going to be arrested damnation come on the alley's clear but it won't be in five minutes i have a motor waiting on the corner of mcdonald street We'll have you ten miles away by the time that patrol gets here. Say, who are you, anyway? My name's Duncan. You're one of his friends, then. Whose? Griswold's. What of it? I'm here to help you now. Don't you believe it? Oh, what you giving me? It's true. Help Reagan? No, damn you. Not Reagan. Emily Griswold's husband. Cut it now. She's your wife, Reagan. You've got to think about her. That's all right. I can manage my wife without no button in from anybody. Understand? You can't. That mob will be here in a minute, and this house won't be safe. I'm going to bring my motor to the side door. Tell her to come down this minute. I'm going to take her home. He goes out quickly. The sound outside has become an angry roar. It is getting nearer. Why? They don't look like strikers. Strikers? You blame fool. It's the town. The town? The whole damn town. Gee, here's where we're up against it. Why? There are a lot of well-dressed men. They haven't any hats. They look... Why, they must be drunk. Ah, uh, go on. They're about as drunk as a bunch of tigers. The roar increases. Hear that? They're mad. Mad clean through. Look at them. The street's full. Why, there must be hundreds. Thousands is more like it. But... But what are they doing up here? Mr. Regan, what are they after? Can't you see? why they come to make a little friendly call on me that's all oh no sir not that it it must be a fire fire be damned if you ever heard a mob a coffin that way before you'd never ask again what it means the roar becomes louder confused and angry as the mob is supposed to climb the fence and trample up the lawn you don't sure i do why every man jack down there's out for blood Something happened in the ward, and they're coming straight for me. Mr. Regan, look. That's Scanlon on the sidewalk. The man with the brown coat. I know him anywhere. And there, do you see? Right beside him? Why, it's old Archibald Houghton, the vice president of First National. Houghton? Ha <laughs> ha. And the fellow climbing the fence. Isn't that Grayson? The senior member of Grayson, Grayson and Company? Yeah, and that feller behind him, that's young Harry Huntington. See? the guy with the cigarette there are a lot of strikers too and look there see those italians by the gate why they're all mixed up gentlemen and toughs scoopers and big businessmen there is a great outburst under the very windows but they all take hold of hands when it comes to hating me look out sir they're right below there they'll see you crash of glass good lord go upstairs and tell me a wife to come down mr duncan's here to get her yes sir he goes out. Outside the door are heard the servants in terrified confusion. Gates running in. Mr. Reagan, Mr. Reagan, there's a crowd of very dangerous-looking fellows outside. He is followed by two terrified maids. They all stand huddled near the door, very much frightened. Another crash from outside. That's right, fire another. 
Give me that brick. Come out of there. He don't dare, the damn coward. Smash his windows. Reagan at telephone. Choke it off. I can't hear. Oh, Mr. Mr. Reagan. Mr. Reagan. Choke it off. Telephoning. Hello. Give me police headquarters. Yeah. Pause. During which another storm of yells and calls is heard outside. This headquarters? I'm Reagan. Yeah, Michael R. Say, I got a mob outside here a smashing me windows. Can you hear him? No? He holds the transmitter towards the window. Another crash of glass outside and yell. Not now? Well, take my word for it and send up Kelly with the reserves. Send up all you got, see? I'll need him, every one. So long. Break into the side! Keep it up! Pull the house down! Aim higher, you missed it that trip. There, I got her! Another crash, followed by a general yell. J'ai peur! J'ai terrible bon peur! C'est des assassins! Oui, des assassins! A brick crashes through one of the windows, falling to the floor amid a shower of broken glass. There is a general commotion. Reagan goes to the window. The crowd outside. He's in there. Try the next one. Soak him! Soak him! That's right, let her go! Another brick crashes in. Reagan runs to the desk and opens one of the drawers. Oh, mon dieu! C'est des apaches! Quelle horreur! Oh, Mr. Gates! Oh, sir, what'll we do? Be calm, young women, be calm. He gathers them together and pushes them towards the door. Reagan! Reagan. Where is he? We want, we want Reagan. Reagan. Reagan! Reagan! Another stone crashes in. A table is overturned and lamp broken. All the servants shriek and rush out. The snake! The coward! Come out where we can see you! Reagan! Reagan! Reagan. We, we want, want Reagan. Reagan! Reagan, taking his automatic revolver from desk drawer. Ye would, would ye? Ye dirty dogs are trying to frighten the women. Ye wait there, I'll show ye. He runs to the window, opens it, and stands there. At his appearance, a chorus of yells go up, and more missiles are hurled. Well, here I am. I'm the man you want. Take a good look at me. I'm right here, and I ain't going to move. The crowd howling. We'll show ya. We got ya. Look at him. Kill, Kill him! him! Kill him! That's right. Yell away. Yellin' don't hurt nobody, so keep it up. Go on. I like to hear ye. But if you bust so much as one more pane of glass, by God, I'll empty this repeater without stopping once to wink. He covers them with his weapon. There is a dead pause, then a chorus of angry moans and jeers. Ah, it ain't loaded. He don't dare. It's one of his tricks. I'll show him. Where's that brick? Say there, you big slob with the red bandana. Yes, you. Drop that brick, or ye... What? All right, I... He lifts his pistol and aims quickly then laughing triumphantly. Ha <laughs> ha I knew I'd get you. What's the answer? You're scared. A whole damn crowd of years scared. You know I'm here with nothing but me wife and a bunch of second girls, but I've got you going. You're hanging over the ropes. The roar of enraged crowd surges up again. We are, hey? We'll show ye. Stop his gaff. Bust in the door. We ain't scared. He can't kid us. Go on, that's right. Don't quit. Reagan raising his pistol. Say, stop right there, do you hear? The first guy that puts his mat on them steps will get a bullet through his nut, understand? Now, come on. Say, why don't you come on and get me? I'm right here already, just a-waiting for ye. Lynch him! Get a rope, boys, and lynch him! Lynch, lynch him. him! The gong and hoofs of a police patrol are heard in the distance, gradually growing nearer. What's that? I didn't catch on to... Oh, all right. Fine and dandy. If you want to lynch me, mister, come right up and start in. That's it. Oh, don't be bashful. Come along. During the end of this speech, the mob raises a sullen roar. Don't let him kid us. Get in the bunch. We'll stop his drip. He can't do nothing. The patrol is now close by. Chase it! The cops! The door behind Reagan opens and Emily appears. She stands calmly at the top of the stairs, putting on her gloves. She is dressed for the street. Whoa, whoa! Clanging of gong and hooves very loud, then cease. Stand back, Zaz, stand back! Move on! Get out of here! Get off that fence! Go on home now. Shove them back, Kaylee! Move on or I'll cave your head in. No back talk. Move on and keep moving. Yes, you, move on! Move on! All right, all right, what's your hurry? Say, wait a minute! 
Let go me arm. All right, I'm going, ain't I? Reagan, howling derisively, laughing, taunting as police shove back the mob. That's it. Give it to em, boys. Beat em up, Kelly. Club their nuts off. Soak em. Kill em. <laughs> Bursting into a roar of triumphant laughter, he closes the window and draws the portiers together, turns, and for the first time sees his wife. Oh, that's you. Where's Mr. Duncan? Mr. Davis said he was here. Is that all Davis told you? Yes. Oh, my God. Is Mr. Duncan downstairs? Mr. Davis said the library. He's out getting the auto through the crowd. He's come to take you home. Home? Is Don here too? I mean, my brother? No, I'm afraid. I'm afraid he ain't here. Well, I'll go downstairs and wait. She starts to go. No, stay here. She stops. There's something I got to tell you. What is it? Well, why don't you tell me? Michael, do you know you're making me rather nervous? Sit down. Go on. Reagan, beginning in a businesslike way. Your brother. Well? Well, he went down to the fourth ward about ten o'clock this morning to talk to all the men who'd stuck by me and hadn't joined the union. Yes, go on. Porky McCoy phoned me he was doing it, and I got mad and said to head him off. Then you came in and we got to talking, and I forgot all about him. And you ducked out, and the mob collected down there, and I felt sure something had gone wrong. Michael. But I didn't know a thing, so help me God if I did, until Porky came and told me all about it. About what? Your brother. Tell me. Tell me quick. What's happened to him? Well, he was saying some rotten stuff about me, and that made the fellers sore, and they began firing things. Porky says it was a brick that caught him on the head. They got him to the hospital as quick as they could. Oh! Reagan, breaking out and rushing to her. Emily, you don't believe I done it. You don't believe I done a thing like that. No, you don't. You can't. Emily, covering her face with her hands. Don! I never knew a thing about it till Porky told me. You know that, don't she, Emily? You know I wouldn't have had it happen for anything in the world. I— Don! Don! Emily, you gotta believe me. I'm on the level this trip. I am. I swear to God I am. Oh, Don! I got the whole town lined up against me. I'm all alone. But if ye believe me, Emily, I don't care. And I'll be good from now on. I'll be as good as I know how. I'll throw up Montreal. I won't foreclose no mortgages. I'll do anything you want if you only believe me now. Oh, you're going to. You do. I knew you would. I knew. He throws himself on his knees before her and bursts into tears, his face buried in her lap like a little boy. Emily, for the first time, realizing his presence. Don't touch me. She pushes him away with a gesture of horror and rises. Emily! Don't come near me. Reagan, seizing her hand. What do you mean? Stop it. Keep away. So you think I done it too? Tell me. Go on. I say you gotta tell me. I don't think. I know. Reagan with a wild Irish yell. Ah! Uh... Throwing her hand away. If you believe I done a thing like that, all right. We'll call it off. Go ahead. What are you waiting for? Clear out of my house. Beat it. Move along. She rushes out. Emily, Emily. I didn't mean that. I swear to God, I didn't know nothing about it. Don't go. Don't leave me, Emily. I ain't got no one else. I'm all alone. Enter three plainclothes police officers by the other door. They are followed by two in uniform. I am sorry, sir, but you've got to come along with us. There's a cab waiting, and... Reagan turns, looks at the officers a moment, then slowly puts on his overcoat and hat, pours and drinks a glass of whiskey, lights a cigar, takes a handful from the humidor, puts them in his pocket, picks up a newspaper, puts it under his arm, and goes nonchalantly towards the door. Come on, boys. He goes up the steps and out, followed by the officers, as the curtain falls. End of Act Third Act Four of The Boss by Edward Sheldon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Fourth 
Reagan's rooms in the police station, three days later. It is a plain room, with a bed, a bureau at right. At back, a large barred window through which the city can be seen. Near window, a big deal table covered with papers, an electric lamp, a big box of cigars, a whiskey bottle, and glasses. Near the door is a waiter's stand, holding a tray covered with a napkin. Reagan is sitting on the window ledge, smoking and dictating to Davis. He wears a sack suit and looks very tired. He is evidently keeping up with difficulty. His fighting spirit is broken. Reagan dictating. I hope my change of plans will not put you or your officers to any inconvenience. Got that? Any inconvenience? Yes, sir. Shifting the grain traffic from this town to Montreal would have been just the sort of job I most enjoyed putting through, and I intended to go into it for all I was worth. But circumstances over which I have no control make it impossible for me to do so. Wishing your business all success and so forth. Just finish her up, Davis. You know how. Davis, writing. So that's the end of Montreal. Davis. Davis, finishing and looking up. Yes, sir. There's something I want to talk to you about. I won't be needing a secretary much longer. Please, sir. Don't let's go into that now. Why not? We got to, sooner or later. I was sort of going to suggest that you take an interest in the business. The business? Yeah, my business. You've been with me eight years, and you know it backwards, and I could hand it right over to you tomorrow. Perhaps you could run it better than I did, I don't know. But gee, I'll bet no one on God's green earth could make it pay so well. Mr. Reagan. Yeah? Don't feel so discouraged. It's going to be all right. You're going to get out of here within a week, and— A week? <laughs> I wonder. Mr. Reagan, you mustn't give up like this. It's not like you, sir, if you don't mind me saying so. That's right. I don't know myself these days. Brace up, sir. Pull yourself together. Look on the bright side of it. Ah, oh, what's the good? Sitting on bed. Hodges was here this morning. Hodges? What did he say? He says if Griswold dies, I'll be indicted for murder in the first degree. Mr. Hodges missed his job. Lawyer? He ought to have been a wet nurse. Why, Mr. Reagan, there's more nerve in one of your back teeth than in two hundred Hodges. He says the district attorney's working night and day for a conviction. They're going over me record with a fine-tooth comb. They're getting evidence from everywhere. Evidence? Let them get it. They can't prove you slung that brick, and they can't prove you had it slung. He says there's only one way to clear myself. We got to find the guy who done it and make him swear he wasn't carrying out my orders. You never gave any orders. I know, but I got to prove I didn't. Well, does Hodges think that man is going to walk in here and say, Please, mister, I slung that brick, and now if it isn't too much trouble, would you kindly electrocute me? Is that what he's waiting for? Ah, oh, gee, I don't know what to do. Whoever he is, I bet by now he's halfway to Nevada. No, Mr. Reagan, if you get out of here, it'll be without his help. If I get out. And you're going to. Do you hear that, Mr. Reagan? You're going to. All right, me son, all right. Looking at watch. Half past four. What time are you going to call for Mrs. Reagan to bring her down? Quarter to five, sir. You'd better be hustling, then. Davis, getting overcoat. Don't worry, sir. I'll be there. Say, Davis. Yes, sir? Reagan, not looking at him. Do you happen to remember what she said last night when you gave her me message? Why, she seemed surprised. Yeah, and then? She asked why you had to see her. I said just what you told me to say, that it was important business connected with Fourth Ward mortgages. She seemed doubtful for a moment and then said she'd come. That's all. And you asked after her brother? He didn't forget that? No. She said his condition hadn't changed, that it wouldn't till after the operation. And Jameson was going to operate tomorrow. A knock at door. Come in. The door opens and an officer enters. Well? Porky McCoy's downstairs. He wants to see you. McCoy? Send him along. All right, sir. He goes out. Reagan, turning joyfully to Davis. It's Porky, do you hear? He's stuck by me. I knew he wouldn't welch like all the rest. I'll start along, then. Looking at a package of papers. Oh, Mr. Reagan, what do you want done with these? What are they? All the Montreal contracts and estimates. Just leave them on the table. I'll look after them. Very well, sir. I... There is a knock at the door. Reagan opening it. Come on in, Parky. As he enters, Reagan pulls him in by the hand. 
gee man but i'm glad to see ye hello mike how's the wife and looking at him say what's the matter nothing they stare at one another davis at the door good night sir he waits a moment for reagan to answer then goes out quietly have a cigar no nah. a drink no nah, thanks say porky ye ain't sore at me are ye sore at you oh mike reagan standing looking at him porky you got something on your mind now go ahead and lay it out to me son mccoy blurting it out mike i never knew they'd think ye did for griswold gee you could have knocked me over with a feather when i heard they pulled ye in i know that me son i know that i didn't mean to play you dirty mike honest i didn't i didn't mean to go back on ye i wouldn't do that for anything in the world of course you wouldn't porky but i've been reading the papers and hearing folks talk and seeing what a good case they made out against ye mike and when larry duggan come in and showed me what the damn district attorney had in the evening's post i i went into the kitchen where my wife was nursing the kid and i begun bawling Ah, oh, gee in about three minutes i'd told her the whole thing you told her yeah and when i'd finished she said you'd been a good friend to me mike and it was up to me and and she brought my overcoat and here i am mike and i guess that's all reagan tenderly patting him on shoulder ye poor feller ah oh, don't smash me kick me beat me to pieces i won't say nothing but don't be good to me mike i can't stand it i can't i can't he breaks down and cries his head on the table reagan putting his hand on his shoulder say porky standing over him do you remember one night in my old bar on lake street gee it's fifteen years ago now and you took my side when kelly's gang came in to murder me for holding back his nomination all the rest had gone back on me it was us two against eight but we got behind the bar and ye grabbed the bung starter and i broke four bottles of canadian rye over kelly's head before i laid him out gee that was a swell scrap and then when it was all over you remember my comin up to ye where ye was leanin over the big round table and a wipin the blood off your chin and sayin mccoy i says for i didn't know ye as well then porky as i do now mccoy says i ye've done me a good turn to-night and perhaps some time i'll have a chance to pay ye back but anyway i says from this time on so help me god there won't nothin come between us two they don't make nothin thin enough for that mccoy looking up mike well that chance i talked about it's been fifteen years a comin porky but i got it now and i guess i'll hang right on what you mean reagan clapping his shoulders go home and tell the missus and the kid it's all right mike reagan says it's all right but mike i done it ye did not porky the man that done it skipped and we can't find him see mike i ain't skipped i'm right here i'm willing to pay up reagan smiling ah oh, come off ye don't know nothing about it nothing nothing at all mike i'm on you're trying to let me off gee porky but you're wise today. but say do you know what'll happen to you now don't you bother your nut about me i'll get out of here you won't if griswold croaks this town will finish ye for good understand it won't lie back until it's buried ye in quicklime gee perhaps you think i care perhaps you think i got a lot to live for well if you do you're off way off miles off but your wife reagan turning away abruptly me wife i ain't got one but your kids the family that's coming to ye family <laughs> but your business that's there you got that all right quit it i'm sick of the business i hate it i wish to god i'd never seen it damn the business that's what i say damn it damn it i didn't mean nothing it's all right porky i'm sort of done up to-day but now you see how i ain't got nothing to live for and remember you got everything everything a man can have so go home now and tell the wife she'll be a-waitin and a-worryin and you ought to let her know but mike i whatever ye did porky ye did it as my man ye did it for me understand and as head of the firm i guess i stand responsible for me employee with a change of manner taking out his pocket-book say porky what day did you say the christenin was christenin yeah smiling michael reagan ignatius mccoy it's sunday week but reagan taking out a bill and putting it in mccoy's hand well you take this and get the boy a present one of them silver mugs is the regular thing and if there's anything left over just set up drinks for the crowd will ye no mike i reagan pressing the bill into his hand 
oh rats go on and take it and tell the good woman i'm i'm awful sorry i can't be at the church meself that day to hold the kid you know i was kind of looking forward to that somehow but he hesitates embarrassed mike i won't let you do this i did for griswold it was my fault now it's up to me to ah oh, shut your face i won't i'm going straight downstairs and tell him how it happened you dry up or i'll bust your jaw ye'll tell them downstairs ye'll tell them nothing do you hear ye'll walk out of this place without opening your mug wide enough to spit and ye'll do it cause i tell ye to by god there ain't no bigger reason knock at door come in the door opens and the officer appears what do you want there's a lady to see you sir there is a slight pause tain't another one of them female reporters no sir it's your wife she's down in the inspector's office all right i'm ready ask her to come up all right sir the officer goes out so long so long parky would you mind shaking hands why should i mind me son he does so gee you're the best i i ever met ah go on porky goes out quickly reagan left alone looks about then quickly and awkwardly begins tidying up the room fixing the napkin to cover the tray he makes the desk a little more orderly throwing cigar ends and ashes in the waste basket he picks up the cuspidor and drops it behind the washstand he pours water in the basin, washes his hands, wipes them on the towel, throws the towel behind the washstand, sets the pitcher back in the bowl in the water. While brushing his coat, he sees his pajamas and throws them under the pillow, thumps the pillow, and is covering the red blanket with the counterpane when Emily softly opens the door and pauses, watching him. He does not see her. Emily, at last. Michael? Reagan, starting suddenly and turning. Is that you? I didn't hear ye. Emily, entering. They said to go right in. Sure, of course. Won't she sit down? He offers her a chair. Thank you. She sits. There is another awkward pause. I hope you're feeling well. Oh, I'm well enough, but rather tired, that's all. I know. You you're look looking. They both stop. I beg your pardon, after you... Emily, glancing about uneasily. You look fairly comfortable here. Somehow I didn't expect to find things as... as comfortable. Reagan, embarrassed, looking about, too. Yeah, they been real good to me, the boys have. Davis comes here every day, and I got a telephone in the hall, and they send in me grub from that hotel across the street. No, it ain't so bad. When... when you get used to it. Mr. Davis said you wanted to see me about those Fourth Ward mortgages. Yeah. I want to make an assignment. I want to deed them over to you, if you don't mind. Deed them over to me? How do you mean? Put them in your name. Let ye work them the way you want. Give them to ye. Understand? But I thought you were going to foreclose. I changed me mind. Why? Reagan, not looking at her, speaking with difficulty. I don't know. At window. When you're up against it, the way I am now, you sort of feel like squaring everything up. And I thought... See, and you was so interested in them folks down there, you'd like to have an eye on em yourself and keep em out of trouble. They're just like kids, you know. They need looking after. Oh, Michael. Reagan, glancing up at her. Will you do it, then? Yes, I'll do it, if you want me to. Reagan, very businesslike. All right. I had Hodges frame up an acceptance of the assignment. Taking it from envelope. Will you look at it? It's very short, you see, but it covers the ground. She looks at him but when he holds out the paper she takes it and bends her head is there anything you don't understand i know them legal words is apt to mix a lady up emily turning away to wipe her eyes without letting him see her no it's quite clear quite then would you mind signing it now and i'll give it to hodges in the morning where do i sign there under my name gives her a pen look out it's sort of inky it's all right she takes the pen and signs the paper there you're the boss now you're the boss of the fourth ward perhaps you'll be a better one than me thank you michael a pause he waves the paper to dry it i i suppose you'll be going to montreal very soon no why not reagan thumb towards window look at them bars ain't they a good reason but michael i might as well tell you right now 
I don't stand much show a getting out of here. You mean, on account of Don? Reagan, looking away. Yeah. Then you don't know. Know what? That it's all right. That he's going to get well. Nah. That's what Dr. Jameson says. He operated at two o'clock. Today. And Don knew me before I left the hospital. Oh, gee, I'm glad. I'm awful glad. Emily, looking away. Yes, it means a lot to you, too, doesn't it? Reagan, suddenly shy. Well, I... I wasn't thinking of myself just then. Emily, still looking away. So you can probably go north after all. Yeah, I suppose I can. He has the package of papers Davis left. I suppose I can, but somehow I guess I won't. He tears up the papers carefully, methodically, and drops them in the basket. Michael, what... what are those papers? Reagan, looking at the pieces. My contracts with Montreal, or what's left of them. You're giving that up, too? It looks that way. But why? You don't have to. Can't I do a decent thing sometimes just for the fun of it? You don't mean you're doing it for yourself? Well, I ain't doing it for anyone else, am I? Emily, with growing emotion. Michael, I sided against you yesterday. Reagan, under his breath. I know that. Well, you've done so many dreadful things, and I knew how you felt about Don. When you told me, it all seemed to go together. I... I couldn't think. Don't begin on that again, please. But now... Michael, look at me. He does so. A pause. Emily, putting her hands on his shoulders. It's all right. I'm sure now. I know you didn't do it. You don't mean you believe me? Yes. And oh, Michael, you've got to forgive me for not believing you before. She takes his hand. Quit it. Don't. Emily, taking both hands. But I'll make up for it, you see? And now we're going to turn our backs on everything that's happened. We're going to look up. We're going to look ahead. We're going to start all over, you and I. Together. Ah, quit it. Don't talk that way. Go home. Go home, you hear. Leave me be, I tell you. Leave me be. I won't. I can't. I married you, Michael. And when a woman marries a man, I believe she promises all sorts of things I've never lived up to. But now you need me, and I can help you. Why, well, I think it's a good time to begin. You don't mean you're willing to do all that for me? Willing? Why, I want to. Don't you see? I want to. Reagan, collecting himself. Thank ye. Thank ye kindly. I know you're just saying that to make things easy for me, but I'm, I'm awful obliged to ye. I'm not, Michael. You don't understand. You... Gee, I've been sort of feeling our finish coming on for the last six months. And now, all of a sudden, it's right here. And somehow I can look it in the face and keep on smiling just the same. What do you mean? You was right when you said that you and me have got to start all over again. Only this time we got to start alone. But, Michael... Now, wait a second, Emily. I guess we needn't bother much now we're at the end. If anyone could have pulled this off, why, we'd have been the ones. But we didn't have no show. We was in all wrong. Dead wrong. From the very beginning. Was it? So wrong? Yeah. I was wrong in thinking I could ever make ye happy. And you was wrong. Well, in thinking ye could ever let me try. I guess twas my fault, mostly. You was doing it for a bunch of scoopers, and I was just out for meself, like I always been. I might have known there couldn't be nothing between us two, a guy born in a back room over a bar and a lady like yourself. Don't. Please don't. Do you know one thing I learned from being with you this way? And gee, I don't see just what good it's ever going to do me. Slowly and with difficulty. Folks have to love each other awful hard before they can get married. If you and me had done that... Why, we could have stood up and looked the world in the eye and told it to go to hell. But, as it is... His voice breaks. Michael! It's all right. The bill's paid. The account's closed. And if there's any forgiven to be done, I'll do my share. I hope God gives you everything you never could get from me, and that you live happy and grow old slow. And good luck to you now, me darling. Good luck to you, and good-bye. He turns away. The door opens, and the inspector comes in. Mr. Regan? Well? That man, McCoy. Huh? It's all right, sir. He let out the whole thing. Regan smothers an exclamation. He went downstairs to Judge Swain and made an affidavit. 
The judge has ordered to your release, and you can leave us, Mr. Regan, any time you like. Parky. Emily, in a low voice, to the inspector. He did it, then. That's what he's sworn to, Mum. Would you call my chauffeur? I'm... I'm going to take my husband home. Sure, Mum. Sure. He goes out. Emily, turning to Regan. Michael, there's something I've never told you. Is there? I've never told you, because I never knew it until now. Didn't ye? Can't you guess what it is? I'm no good at guessing when it comes to you. All right, then, I'll tell you. I think... I think... I think it's going to be all right. What's going to be all right? She runs over to the clothes rack. Is this your overcoat? Taking it from the rack. Here now, put it on. She holds it for him. And your hat. He starts to take it. Wait, I'll show you how you'll have to wear it now. She puts it on his head. He pushes it on one side. No, straight. She straightens it. Quite straight. It's always bothered me before. Reagan, feeling it gingerly. Like that? Like that. Now take it off. Why? Emily, half laughing, half crying. Do you think I'm going to let you kiss me with it on? He throws his hat across the room and catches her in his arms as the curtain falls. End of Act Four End of The Boss by Edward Sheldon